I'd like to welcome everybody here to the uh, McGuire Woods um, uh, Wealth Planning Scouting Report. We are um, pleased um, to have you all join in us here virtually for this event and um, think that it's a great opportunity to remember that this is a legacy. Uh, we're continuing a legacy that the McGuire Woods Private Wealth Services Group started um, uh, 10 or 15 years ago holding um, events like this in the fall, often in person, and uh, we would get together to talk about the trends and developments that we have been seeing in this world, our world, estate planning, tax planning, and estate and trust administration, and share that with you, our friends uh, from across the community um, who are involved at corporate trustees, investment advisors, insurance companies, and all the like, including other lawyers and accountants. So we're happy to have you all here and want to remember that great legacy um, that started this program off. Um, during COVID, we had to make some um, changes to the program. We couldn't meet in person, and so we shifted to a virtual event. And we have been bringing back this event in a sort of different way, having some in-person events uh, in cities where we are located and having this as the culmination of a series where we're virtual, pulling on resources from across our group and across our firm. So we want to uh, welcome you all uh, here today. Um, thank you for being a part of it. As we, uh, as I mentioned, we call this our scouting report. And I give credit to a partner in our Richmond office, Michael Barker, who developed that idea of the scouting report. Um, in giving a presentation some years ago, um, he came up with that title um, uh, because he wanted to present information across all that he um, and we have learned uh, over the last year and try to identify um, what's happening broadly. What are the major themes that we are facing and share it with you and hopefully get some feedback um, either through questions um, in the presentation today or afterwards. We look forward to that feedback to see whether you think our scouting matches up to your scouting. Um, let me, one, one note, we are doing some, some questions here. You're able to submit questions through the um, uh, webinar platform. We look forward to you doing that. Um, and if anything comes across, you have a question or follow up, you can reach out um, to uh, Laura and our team or directly to the presenters um, to follow up on any of the important um, things we're talking about today. So let me, before we get into the substance, um, offer my thanks to uh, uh, some folks that have made this possible. We could not do this without uh, the marketing uh, team that supports our efforts, helping coordinate all of our colleagues and this, uh, the logistics of this presentation. Also, McGuire Woods has what I think is the best sort of meeting support and technology team I've ever encountered and thank every one of them that, has, that makes a meeting like this possible. It is behind the scenes and tireless and, and we do appreciate it. Um, in addition, and most importantly, also, I'd like to thank our speakers. We've asked uh, colleagues, not only in our private wealth services group, but across our firm to join us today and talk about some important topics. It's a, a big lift to prepare the materials and prepare themselves for the presentation. So we thank everyone for being a part of it. And it's a great opportunity to showcase um, to you, our, our visitors and guests today, the strength across our firm. And first up, um, we're going we're gonna to start with having um, a, a tag team um, talking about the Corporate Transparency Act. We're going to then walk into a presentation about international estate planning. We'll have a short break. We'll come back and hear from some of our uh, friends in the McGuire Woods Consulting Group to talk about what's happened this week in the election and what we might see going forward. These are the things and themes that we see as challenges that we'll be facing uh, over the next year. Mobility of clients in international estate planning, changes in tax laws and regulations, and um, the Corporate Transparency Act. For that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Farhan Zaru, who works with me in our Washington office in the Private Wealth Services Group. And we're pleased to have um, Abby Cross join us from Richmond she is in our corporate group and specializes not only in what we think of as classic deal work, um, 
but also corporate governance matters. And it's a really interesting place where these two things, corporate governance and our private wealth services and estate planning, are going to have um, a lot of connection over the Corporate Transparency Act in the future. And Farhan, Abby, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Bill. Um, good morning, everybody, uh, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Farhan Zaru, and like Bill said, I am part of the Private Wealth Services Group at McGuire Woods. Uh, my practice centers around estate, gift, and tax planning for families, uh, individuals, high net worth individuals. Um, and like Bill said, Abby is also in the corporate group. Um, and so our different backgrounds um, will come into play during this presentation as well. We'll try to highlight some of those um, uh, specialty areas as, as demonstrated throughout the Corporate Transparency Act, um, which is the topic of our discussion today. Um, so this is, this is our agenda for today. We're going to start off with a high-level overview of the Act and then dive into some more of the uh, more specific requirements that the Act requires. And then at the end, we will uh, do some takeaways and some uh, practice points. And at the end, we'll try to leave some time for questions. But if we run out of time, uh, you can feel free to email us. I think our emails are, are in the materials. You can reach out by email or, or even call us if, if you'd like to, to talk about some of these points. So the Corporate Transparency Act uh, was enacted in, on January 1st, 2021, as part of the National Defense Authorization Act. The act requires certain reporting companies to submit specified beneficial ownership information to the Department of Treasury's Financial Crimes and Enforcement Network which is known as FinCEN. Some of you may be familiar with FinCEN through FBAR reporting and otherwise, um, so that is the same, the same governmental entity. The target of the legislation is anonymous shell companies that engage in illicit activities. Those illicit activities include piracy, tax fraud, money laundering, drug trafficking, um, but the, uh, the act affects everybody. So it's very broad and over encompassing um, so even legitimate businesses that carry on you know, good business activities are going to have to comply with this act. So it's just not going to affect uh, the target of, of, of the act itself. Um, and there's a lot of background and motivation that went into the act. And uh, there are some, uh, some rulings that FinCEN issued that go into all that background. And it's very lengthy, and we don't really have much time to talk about that today. Um, but the extremely boiled down version of that is that the United States was viewed on the international level as, as lacking in its enforcement of money laundering and, and some of these illicit activities. Uh, and so the CTA brings the U.S. into compliance with those international standards. Uh, the final regulations, like I said, do a good job of explaining the history and how we got to this point, um, if you're interested, and, and there's some, some colorful language there. Um, so the basics of, of the Corporate Transparency Act, who reports, entities that are reporting companies, so those are the, the companies that are going to have to report to FinCEN certain information, to whom, like I said, FinCEN is going to be the recipient of the information, and they will maintain a centralized and secure database. The database will be accessible by certain governmental entities that we'll discuss in a little bit. And then the reporting companies are going to have to disclose identifying information of beneficial owners, which we'll talk about in a bit, and, and applicants, which we'll also talk about in a bit. And we'll also talk about what sorts of information you, they're going to have to disclose. Um, there's, going to, there's penalties, civil and criminal penalties, that will apply for people that don't comply with, it, with the act. And then the effective date is January 1st, 2024, uh, which is... It's, it's, it's about a little over a year from now, so it, it is rapidly approaching. So why do we care about the Corporate Transparency Act, and, and why should you care about it? Um, I think the one word that comes to mind when I think of the CTA is broad. It is extremely broad and over-encompassing and, and also vague. Um, don't be fooled by the Corporate Transparency Act because it affects more than just corporations. Uh, it affects LLCs, partnerships, and, and Abby will get into what sorts of entities it addresses in a little bit, but it's not just corporations. So 
Um, it's a little bit of a misnomer. And, and as a result of that, FinCEN estimates that 32.6 million uh, entities will have to report on day one, January 1st, 2024. And 5 million new entities will have to report each year after that for an additional 10 years. So that's a lot of entities. Um, and so there's, it's, it's going to require a lot of, of practitioners. And as an estate planner, I you know, help my clients with formation and governance uh, and things of that nature. Um, and so this is going to affect my, my work and what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's also going to affect uh, accountants, financial advisors, uh, business consultants, uh, and attorneys like myself uh, that help their clients and advise their clients on corporate formation and, and, and governance. Um, and not only does the CTA, uh, is it broad, uh, it's also burdensome um, and it, 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 it's riddled with exceptions and there's a lots of, uh, you know, fine print that you'll need to work through uh, to make sure you're compliant. And like I said, it's effective January 1st, 2024. So uh, we have about a year to get uh, a hold of all the exceptions and all the requirements. Um, so I'm going to, so we're going to jump into some of the main points that you'll need to understand regarding the Corporate Transparency Act. Um, there's three major terms, uh, one of which is a reporting company, which is on the slide there. Uh, the second is a beneficial owner, uh, which we'll talk about in a bit. And then there's a company applicant. Um, so Abby's going to start us off with talking about what is uh, a reporting company under, under the act. So the reporting requirements fall on reporting companies. So it's important to understand what that is. The final rule describes two types of reporting companies. There are domestic reporting companies and foreign reporting companies. Domestic reporting companies are corporations, LLCs, or other entities that are created by the filing of a document pursuant to the laws of US state or Indian tribe. A foreign reporting company is a corporation, LLC, or other entity that's created in a foreign jurisdiction that is registered to do business in the US by filing a document with the Secretary of State or other similar office. And that's defined by state law and tribal law. The final rule does not describe other entity types, but FinCEN in its comments to the rule has noted that it expects other types of entities to file as well. And that includes limited liability partnerships, business trusts like statutory trusts, and most limited partnerships. So the CTA is clear that state corporation corporate formation law and practices dictate whether an entity is a reporting company. It comes down to whether the entity files to be created or to do business in the US. The target here is smaller non-registered companies that may act as shell companies for either money laundering or other illicit activities. So you now might be thinking, does every single corporation, LLC, or other entity need to report? And the answer is no. So there are certain um, companies that are just not within the scope of, of the act. And those are companies that aren't filing documents to be created or to do business in the US. That's like general partnerships, foreign entities not registered in the US, and wealth planning trusts. The final rule also has 23 exemptions, and I'll spare you, I won't go through each of them, but there's a few I wanna point out. All of the exemptions really deal with companies that are already regulated. So you think of public companies, who are making filings with the SEC, its governmental authorities, public utilities, banks and bank type entities like credit unions, accounting firms, investment advisors, securities brokers and dealers. And then there's an important exemption for what's called a large operating company. And this is a company that employs more than 20 full-time employees has filed a tax or information return in the previous year, demonstrating that it has had more than $5 million in gross receipts and sales, and has an operating presence at a physical office in the US. 
So the upshot here is that if you qualify for the exemption, you don't need to make a, you don't need to file a report. Under the final rule, you're not filing to claim an exemption. And FinCEN has said, we're not issuing certificates of exemption. So, you know, to, shout, to preview what's to come, there are penalties for not filing, both criminal and civil. So if you're relying on an exemption, you need to make sure that it applies. So what information needs to be reported? There are four categories of information for the companies. It's the legal name, trade name, and doing business as name, whether or not that name is registered. It's a street address of its principal place of business in the US. Four reporting companies with a principal place of business outside of the US. It's the street address of their primary location in the US. And like other filings, you cannot use a PO box and you also can't use a third party address like a registered agent. You also need to provide the jurisdiction of formation or the jurisdiction where the registered company first registered to do business in the case that it's a foreign company. And then an IRS taxpayer ID number, a TIN. For foreign reporting companies that don't have a TIN, you need to provide the tax ID number of a foreign jurisdiction together with the name of that jurisdiction. Okay, uh, th thanks Abby. Um, so now we will turn our attention to another important question. So Abby just talked about what is a reporting company. So like uh, the, now the reporting companies have to report their beneficial owner. So I'm gonna talk about who is a beneficial owner. There are two flavors to beneficial ownership. Uh, the CTA defines a beneficial owner for the purposes of the act uh, as an indiv any individual who directly or indirectly through any contract, arrangement, understanding or relationship exercises substantial control over the reporting company or owns or controls not less than 25% of the ownership interests of a reporting company. So those are the two flavors, exercises substantial control or owns or controls not less than 25%. So if an individual meets one of those two flavors, then the reporting company will be required to report that beneficial owner unless the individual is exempt. Um, just like everything in this act, there's, there's always an exemption, um, but that's the general rule. Oops. Um, so the first uh, prong I'm going to talk about is the substantial control test. Um, an interesting thing is that the CTA did not initially define what substantial control means, um, but the, the regulations that recently were issued about a month ago did expand upon the definition of substantial control and did provide some guidance. And so the, 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 the regulations stated that there are four different indicators of substantial control, all of which there are on the slide. The first is an individual that serves as a senior officer of a reporting company. A senior officer can be a CEO, a CFO, a COO, uh, it can be the general counsel, um, and, and so you could have multiple individuals that have substantial control if, if you have um, all, the, all of those positions. Um, but the title is not uh, dispositive of whether that person is, is, has substantial control. The underlying question is whether that individual is exercising authority or performing the functions of a senior officer. Um, the regulations actually remove the positions of secretary and treasurer as being one of those senior officers, essentially stating that those two positions don't offer substantial, uh, don't have substantial control. Um, and so the second uh, indicator of substantial control is uh, kind of a de facto person, and that is an, an individual whose authority over the appointment or removal of any senior officer or a majority of the board of directors of a reporting company. The third indicator of substantial control is an individual that directs, determines, or has substantial influence over important decisions made by a reporting company. 
And that is an extremely broad, all-encompassing uh, indicator there. And the regulations actually give a non-exhaustive list of what uh, sort of influence can constitute substantial control. Um, and they say that the sale, lease, or mortgage of a majority of, of company assets, um, decisions regarding the reorganization of the entity, dis dissolution or merger of a reporting company, uh, dis decisions regarding compensation and executive benefits of the reporting company, uh, any individual that can amend the corporate go documents, um, and there's, there's, there's numerous more. But all of those sorts of uh, factors can, can show that that person has uh, uh, control over those, those, those big decisions. Um, and so the fourth category on the slide is, is a catch-all. And it essentially says any other person that has any other form of substantial control over a reporting company, um, and that's just kind of circular there, and uh, is really just meant to catch uh, sorts of unique structures. That's what FinCEN says. It, it looks looking. It, it understands that people will, will try to be creative and try to to try to plan around these requirements, and so they want to have the ability to. Uh, uh, catch those certain bad actors that are trying to skirt around the law and use uh, uh, less conventional ways to um, to not report. So even though we are giving four categories, as you can see, they are extremely broad, um, especially the last two. Um, and so it's it's important uh, to kind of go into the regulations and and read through all of the. They have examples that you can see, and so it's good to read those and, and see how. They might affect uh, companies that you work with or companies that you, you deal with. Um, it's, it's important to keep a few things in mind. Substantial control can be indirect or direct. Um, more than one person can exercise substantial control. So like I said earlier, you can have a CEO, a CFO, uh, and multiple board positions that all would have to be reported because they're all would be uh, deemed to have substantial control. Um, and it's not... Uh, intended to include ordinary managerial decisions. Um, and I'll get to an example about that in a second. Um, FinCEN does expect that every reporting entity would have at least one person that has substantial control. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, they do think that every reporting entity would, would at least have one. Um, and so an example that the regulations threw out there was an example of a constru construction com supply company. Um, and there was an individual named Nathan, and he was a manager and a chief clerk for 40 years. Uh, he was responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the construction company and, uh, and this day-to-day -day operations and staffing. He had the, the authority to hire floor staff, but not senior officers. He controlled the petty cash, uh, payroll disbursements, uh, and he was a signatory for checks, but not more than $5,000. And the regulation said that person, Nathan, did not exercise substantial control, and so you wouldn't have to report him. I think if the facts were a little bit different there and he was able to uh, write checks for a little bit larger amount, I think he may because he could dispose of a lot of the assets of the company. Um, but that's just an example that they, they put in the regulations. So the second flavor of beneficial owners are um, the ownership test, and it's an alternative test. And just like the substantial control test, the statute didn't initially provide much guidance into what it means. Uh, but like, like the substantial control test, the regulations did provide some insight into what, the, what FinCEN is, is looking for. Um, so an individual meets the ownership test if the individual owns or controls not less than 25% of the ownership interest of the entity. Um, that was a few slides ago. So the ownership test is a three-part test. The first part is you have to have an ownership interest, um, and, that, and that's on the slide there. And that can include equity, stock, uh, capital or profits interest, convertible instrument options, um, and there, there's a whole laundry list of different interests that can constitute an ownership, ownership interest. The second prong is the ownership or control of the, over the ownership interest. An individual may directly or indirectly, that language again, own or control an ownership interest of a reporting company through any contract, arrangement, understanding, relationship, otherwise, including joint ownership with one or more persons of an undivided interest in such ownership interest through another individual as a nominee or agent, 
or through a trust or similar arrangement that holds such ownership interest. Um, and like I said earlier, I'm in the private wealth group, so trusts uh, ring true with me. Um, and so uh, looking at the trust angle, the final, final regulations did provide some specific guidance here. Um, and they stated that a trustee is a uh, exercise of substantial control. So flat out does. Um, but as well as someone that can direct distributions. So if there's a distribution committee, um, that, that group of people would also be deemed to have substantial control. Um, also a beneficiary of a trust can be deemed to have substantial control if they can withdraw the assets or if the beneficiary is the sole income lifetime beneficiary um, uh, and, and of principle during his or her lifetime. So a beneficiary can also be deemed to have substantial control. And what I found surprising was also a grantor can be deemed to have substantial control if the grantor can revoke the trust, which makes sense, um, or can withdraw the trust assets. Um, and that made me think, well, what about a grantor trust scenario where the grantor can, has the power to exchange assets with the trustee for equal value, um, but it's an irrevocable trust, is that withdrawal? Um, my thinking is, is yes, that that grantor would be, be deemed to have substantial control over whatever was held in the trust. Uh, but it'd be interesting to see if, if Fenton provides some additional guidance on that. Um, and so one consequence of this, like I touched on earlier, is you could have multiple beneficial owners uh, just for a trust. You know, if you have a scenario where the trust has multiple, or has a, an income beneficiary and principal beneficiary and two trustees and a grantor that can swap assets, you know, that's, that's four individuals you're going to have to report. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a discretionary trust that can distribute amongst multiple beneficiaries, one trustee, uh, and the grantor can't swap assets, it could just be the trustee that would have to report. But in all, in all circumstances, the trustee is, is deemed to be uh, have substantial control. Um, and so the third prong of the ownership test is that it must be greater than 25%. Um, and that is calculated by uh, adding the individual's aggregate ownership in the company and dividing it by the total ownership of the company. Um, and the test can be different between partnerships and corporations. Uh, for a corporation, you take the individual, the, great, the greater of the individual's vote or value and divide it by the entire corporation's vote or value um, ownership interests. And then for partnerships, they look at capital profits uh, compared to the whole, the whole company's uh, profits, capital profits interest. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, there are some exceptions to the beneficial ownership rules um, listed there on the slide. Uh, minor children provided that the reporting company report, reports the required information for the parent or legal guardian of the minor child. The, uh, a minor child is determined under the state laws of the company of, of, of the entity. So if the entity is formed in Nevada, then it would, you would look to Nevada to define what a minor child is. Um, another exception is a nominee, intermediary, intermediary custodian, or agent. Um, and Vincent states that this is not intended to govern arm's length transactions or uh, contractual services such as attorneys. Um, so they made it clear that those sorts of people are ignored for the purposes of, the, uh, uh, um, of determining beneficial owners. So we would be accepted from that. Um, employees, solely, uh, so long as they're solely acting as an employee of the reporting company and provided that that person is not a senior, a senior officer. Uh, the fourth uh, exception here is uh, an individual whose only interest in a reporting company is a future interest, interest through a right of inheritance. So an individual that is a potential beneficiary under a trust or a will um, or any other sort of uh, state planning document would not be deemed to be a beneficial owner and falling under this exception. So just the, the expectation or the future contingent right of receiving that property is not sufficient. But once the person um, does actually receive the assets through the document, then they would be required to report uh, within a certain period of time, which, which Abby will touch on in a little bit. 
Um, and that precise moment where the individual obtains the ownership interest would be governed by the trust or the, the relevant law uh, of the probate. Um, and the last category up there is, is the, the creditors um, of, of the reporting company. So they are accepted unless they otherwise meet the definition of a beneficial owner otherwise. So creditors, just by their position of a creditor, the, the, uh, just by their position of, of a creditor, doesn't make them a, a beneficial owner. Um, and with these examples, it is important to look at the, uh, the regulations because they provide a lot of guidance and examples and framework around these, these exceptions. And so you can see some, some examples that, the, that FinCEN uh, put in there. And so, like I said, each beneficial owner will have to, well, the, the reporting company will have to re report uh, information regarding their beneficial owners and applicants. Um, and Abby is going to talk about applicants in a minute, but they kind of encompass the same information. Uh, you'll, the, each the reporting company is going to have to report the legal name of a beneficial owner, the date of birth of a beneficial owner, the residential address of a beneficial owner, um, and then the business address for applicants and a residential address for applicants. Um, and then you'll also need to do uh, report a unique identifying number from an acceptable identification document to fence and you have to report that which will be a driver's license or a passport number obviously it has to be unexpired and then you have that image that document has to have an image so a passport and a driver's license would, would fit that requirement um, the, the one point there is an individual can apply for a FinCEN identification number if it's if if FinCEN issues an, that number to the individual rather than report all this information, the reporting company can actually just give FinCEN that identification number. So they don't have to contact the beneficial owner to get all this information. They can just report the number, uh, like envision, like, a, like a, it's like a social security number for, for these purposes. Um, one interesting point that I thought that you don't have to report the ownership interest of the individual. So you don't have to say if they are exercising substantial control or if they have a 45% interest or a 30% 30, 30 interest, there's no requirement that you have to actually disclose to FinCEN the ownership interest of the beneficial owner. So I thought, I thought that was an interesting point that they didn't include that there. Um, so now we're going to move on. So the same list of information that needs to be reported for beneficial owners is the same for company applicants. So what is a comp company applicant? For domestic companies, a company applicant is an individual who files the document that creates the entity. For foreign reporting companies, the company applicant is the individual who files the document that registers the entity to do business in the U.S. For both types of reporting companies, a company applicant is also the individual who is primarily responsible for the filing if more than one individual is involved. So unlike beneficial owners, with company applicants, there would be at most two. And so it's a balancing act. It's the, you know, the goals of the act of getting this information versus the burdens on reporting companies. But there is some relief here. So for reporting companies that were in existence prior to the effective date, they do not need to provide this company applicant information. For entities that are created on or after the effective date, they do need to provide this information. And so I think it's important to remember, you know, why does FinCEN want this info? And it's related to the, the, its use for investigations. They're trying to look for patterns and trends between who is making these filings. And they can trace it back to the same applicant, the same business addresses to sort of track these shell companies and see where the money is coming from. So if, if you look in the regulations, you'll see throughout uh, that FinCEN dedicates a lot of time and effort into privacy and data breaches and how they are going to prevent those sorts of leaks from uh, their database. And their database is called BOSS. 
beneficial ownership secure system and the boss system will receive, store, and maintain the beneficial ownership in, uh, information. And so, like I said, FinCEN is very concerned about this. And they, like I said, they, they, they show that in the regulations by talking about all these sorts of things and authority that they're going to do to protect the information. Um, they say that it's going to be an online application form that you'll just go online and, and fill out. They're thinking about whether they want to accept paper applicants, but they haven't expressly said one way or another whether they're going to do that or not. Um, and so the BOSS system, which is going to collect all this information, uh, will only be disclosed in certain situations. Um, and so the Act lays out which, what those situations are, and there are two. Well, there's three, but two, two major ones. Um, the first is a federal agency that requests the, requests the information for national security, intelligence, or law enforcement activity used in furtherance of that, uh, of, that, uh, of that activity. And the second is from a state, local, or tribal law enforcement agency if a court has authorized the agency to seek the information in a criminal or civil investigation. For the state and local court, it needs to be a court of of competent jurisdiction. The regulations don't really go much more into that, but they say it must be a, a competent jurisdiction court. Um, thus, thus, thus such, uh, the federal uh, agencies can get the information upon request without court authorization, and for states and local governments, um, agencies, it will, it will, they'll need to get court authorization to get the inf information from FinCEN. Uh, FinCEN can also disclose information uh, to a federal agency uh, on behalf of a foreign law enforcement agency, um, and then also to assist financial institutions in their due diligence requirements, FinCEN may also disclose beneficial ownership information to those financial institutions, but only with the consent of the beneficial owner. Oh, no, sorry, with the, with, only with the consent of the reporting company. Um, and as I will touch on in a few slides, uh, the regulations instill great penalties on people uh, or institutions that, that steal or unauthorize access the information that's in the BOSS system. So like I said, they, they do take a lot of steps to protect this information from unauthorized use and the, the penalties are, are, are very heavy. So when does this all kick in. Uh, the date reporting begins is January 1st, 2024, the effective date. And so when companies must file depends on a few different factors. It depends when the reporting company was created or registered to do business, and it matters what type of report it is. Is it an initial report? Is it a corrected report? Or is it an updated report? So for initial reports, for reporting companies that were in existence before the effective date, so January 1st, 2024, their initial reports must be filed no later than January 1st, 2025. So those companies have one year to make their initial filing. For newly created entities, so those that are created on or after the effective date, their reports must be filed within 30 days of the earlier of either the date the company receives actual notice that it's been created or registered to do business, or when a secretary of state or similar office first provides public notice that the company has been created or registered. And this second part really takes into, um, into fact different states, how, how they um, process this information. And so it's really looking towards publicly accessible uh, registries. So then you make your initial filing. When are updated reports required? So if there's a change with respect to the required information previously submitted to FinCEN regarding a company or its beneficial owners, including changes with respect to who is a beneficial owner or information reported for any particular beneficial owner. So in the example of a minor child, when that child attains the age of majority, an update needs to be filed. And the, register, the reporting company must 
file an update within 30 days after the date the change occurs. With respect to a deceased beneficial owner, an updated report identifying a new beneficial owner or owners must be filed within 30 days of the settlement of the deceased beneficial owner's estate. So it's not from the date of death, it's the settlement of the estate. And corrected reports must also be filed. So if a report was inaccurate when it was filed and remains inaccurate, the reporting company must file a corrected report within 30 days after the reporting company becomes aware or should have known that it, of the inaccuracy. And I thought to myself, okay, what happens if a company is a reporting company and qualifies, but then later qualifies for one of the exemptions? What do you do? And so this is deemed a change and the reporting company must file uh, an exemption and the, sorry, an updated report within 30 days and then will be exempted. So if you previously are a reporting company, then you qualify for an exemption, you have to file an updated report to qualify. On the updated report, you must indicate that you are no longer a reporting company. And FinCEN has also noted that it does not expect reporting companies to file an updated report upon termination or dissolution. Great. Um, so penalties and failure to report. Um, there are two types of violations that the CTA sets out um, and two types of penalties, civil and criminal for each. Uh, the CTA makes it unlawful for any person to willfully provide or attempt to provide false or fraudulent ownership information to FinCEN or willfully fail to report, complete, or update beneficial ownership information to FinCEN. The civil penalty is a fine of $500 per day. The criminal fine penalty is $10,000 fine and imprisonment of no more than two years. Uh, the second type of violation is, is for an unauthorized disclosure or use of beneficial ownership information. So like I mentioned earlier, uh, FinCEN has that, the boss system. And so I think this is trying to target individuals that somehow access that information and use it uh, criminally. And so the civil penalty is the same, $500 per day. And the criminal penalty is uh, even greater of $250,000 in imprisonment of not more than five years. Um, so it's the level up from the, the first uh, type of violation. And there's a third uh, category of violations, which is when FinCEN or the courts find that there is a pattern of unauthorized disclosure, and those impose even greater penalties than, 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 than these two. Uh, fortunately, there are a few safe harbors uh, so a person is not subject to criminal or civil penalty if the person uh, has reason to believe that there's a misstatement in, or inaccurate information in the report and no later than 90 days, uh, which they submit the report, they, they submit a corrected one. So there is a safe harbor to protect individuals from, from these penalties. Um, and so one of the important takeaways from, from the penalties is that uh, while the entity is the, is the, I guess, person that's responsible for filing the beneficial ownership information uh, and making the representations and certifications, the company acts through individuals. Um, and who are those individuals? Likely the persons that have substantial ownership. So like I talked about earlier, you know, the CFO, the CEO uh, is likely going to be a substantial, uh, have substantial control over the company. And they're going to be that person that's going to be going online and filing these these uh, these reports, and so although the penalties and the the uh, are assessed against the company, the individuals are going to be the one that are, are held, ultimately held responsible. So a few key takeaways from the corporate law side, uh, I'll touch on three. The first is a practical consideration, and company officers need should be mindful of any impediments to meeting filing deadlines. So now this filing is part of corporate entity formation. It's, and so you need to be mindful of initial, you know, the time that it will take to collect this information. 
you need to ha also have a tax ID number. So you formed your entity, then you immediately need you know, to get your tax ID number to then make this filing. You also need to promptly file, uh, sorry, fill positions for roles that will have substantial control. So those are those senior officers. And then the time it takes to collect company applicant information. You know, you might have a relationship um, or you might not with those forming your entities, especially if you're using some third, sort of third party filing agency. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have that, that information and copies of their IDs. So it is an undertaking to collect all of this information. And as Farhan just said, you're relying on those individuals to give you the information. And the expectation here is that entities are verifying the information prior to submitting the report. So it's really key to have good, a good governance process to handle this, not just with the initial report, but also on an ongoing basis as updates need to be made. And you, you, we just talked about the 30 days. So it's, you, know, you have to stay on top of it. Quarterly is probably not enough. I also wanna note that the final rule does not establish a specific mechanism for companies to seek extensions. So you, you know, time, timeliness here is key. Vincent has noted that they'll consider providing guidance and handling matters on a case-by-case -case basis, but there's no formal process for seeking extensions. The second consideration here deals with ownership interests. So determining that 25% ownership threshold to see who qualifies as a beneficial owner. As Farhan noted, there's a list of different types of interests. However, when you go to calculating the interests, it gets a little bit tricky. We're not just talking about fully exercised equity. So options and similar interests are treated as, treated as though fully exercised when the calculation is conducted. And so this is with respect to contingent interests like options, and it's, I thought it was interesting that the value of contingent in interests is also irrelevant. So for example, if the exercise of an option at the present time would result in an individual holding 26% of the interest in the entity, the individual would be deemed a 20, to control 25% or more of the ownership interests in the reporting company, even if the value of those profit interests is an unknown or insignificant. And the last thing to know on this part is that the final rule does include that catch-all provision for entity types. So an individual will be deemed to hold 25% or more of the total outstanding ownership interests if the individual owns or controls 25% or more of any class or type of the entity's ownership interests. So for those companies that have complex capitalization tables, it's really going to be an undertaking to do this on a person by person level and consider all the different types of equity and, um, and really follow that through. On the future development front, this was the first final rule. There's going to be two more. And so the third is, a, I, I think, of interest um, and that's the customer due diligence rule. And the CDD um, is a requirement for financial institutions. And it's a requirement that they identify and verify, but verify the beneficial owners of legal entity customers. And this is the KYC process. Now we have two different beneficial owner rules. We have one under the CTA that we've walked through today, and there's a separate under the CDD. So the goal here is to have alignment of both rules. I think the upside is that there's the potential for synergies between them that could potentially help uh, lessen the burden on financial institutions and its and uh, companies who are their customers. And in effect, I think the CTA is a requirement that the beneficial ownership information is collected just earlier in the life cycle of a company. It's at its creation, not at the time that it files for um, opens a bank account. I'll turn it over to Farhan. All right. Um, so from an estate planning pers perspective, there's a lot of practice points and there's a lot to think about. Um, but I just wanted to highlight a few of them. Uh, the first being, I'm going to skip to the last one there, actually, education. Um, our clients, a lot of our uh, private clients value being anonymous. And so 
I think when they hear that there's a database where they're going to be revealing this private information, that's going to make them cautious. And so I think educating our clients about the, inf- the protective measures that FinCEN is going to be taking and what they're going to be doing to protect that information will make them a lot more comfortable with giving up this information and submitting it online. Um, and so I think just talking to clients, educating them about what the Corporate Transparency Act is and how it affects them can go a long way and can make them feel a little bit more at ease uh, because there are enforcement mechanisms that protect that information, and so it's just not going to be searchable online by any other by any individual. And th- like I talked about earlier, there's only a few ex- there's two exceptions for in- agencies to access that information. So it's not just going to be readily available for anyone to to go see. Um, also, consideration is compliance. You know, obviously the CTA imposes a huge compliance burden on on individual clients. So that in mind, you know, do you have to consider that when forming new entities? Is an LLC actually the right choice now? Sometimes it was a no-brainer that we would form an LLC to make gifts uh, or, or, or otherwise. Um, but is that the best option now? Would, uh, you know, having the entity or having something held by a trust instead? I think, I think yes, yeah, sometimes a trust may make sense to hold an asset uh, rather than having an LLC when these compliance burdens uh, could be large for if, if it were to be an entity. Uh, one thing I thought was actually kind of funny was that FinCEN said it's going to cost $85 for all fees to, to file the report, which would I guess would be legal fees and whatnot. $85 seems a little low to me. Um, but that's, that's what they came up with uh, on a very simple structure. They estimated the fee to be 1300 for an intermediate structure and 2600 for a complex structure. Um, like I said, I think those are a little bit low, but um, that's what they said that the costs would average out to. Um, and the third takeaway that I want to highlight is drafting. Um, one thing that I think moving forward we're going to have to start thinking about is including language in our operating agreements or in trusts that require shareholders or beneficiaries to disclose this beneficial ownership information to the trustee or to the the board um, because there is no corresponding uh, statutory provision that requires a beneficial owner to to give this this information to the reporting entity. So the reporting entity has to disclose it to FinCEN, but there's no requirement that the uh, the owner has to give it to the company. So that that definitely could be a hurdle um, or an issue that practitioners see. Um, and so maybe drafting language in an operating agreement providing a remedy uh, if a member refuses to comply or refuses to give this information. Um, and so uh, that will be important to consider when, when, when preparing new documents. And also, you know, at the entity level, how do you hold and store this information from your members or from your beneficiaries as a trustee? Um, you know, typically you, you might have some of this information already, uh, but, you know, FinCEN has the boss system. So that's going to be obviously very airtight and secure, but a trustee or an entity that's holding this information from its members or from its beneficiaries, beneficiaries uh, doesn't have that sort of technology to, to guard this information. So thinking through about how to protect this information from bad actors is going to be an important consideration for, for practitioners moving forward. Um, so those are some, some of the, the t- key takeaways that uh, from an estate planning perspective. Um, I think that that's all that we have for today. Um, we appreciate your time uh, today walking, you know, going through the act with us. Um, we have some time, I think, for a few questions. If, if anyone has any questions, feel free to submit through the chat. Um, if we don't see anything pop up, uh, we appreciate your time and, and today. Uh, in a few minutes, I think the next topic will be uh, international state planning. Uh, and my colleague, uh, Steve Murphy, will be taking the reins there. And, and, and giving us some some helpful hints uh, on that topic. Great. 
uh, Farhan and Abby, we're going to bring the uh, presentation back here to Charlottesville, where, um, uh, as Farhan mentioned, um, I'm joined by Steve Murphy, who um, is going to prepare, uh, has prepared and will we'll talk about international estate planning. Um, thinking about the scouting report concept, um, we really do think that um, this is one of those areas that we see um, as increasing in relevance and importance. We may not be dealing with it today, um, but it is something we will be dealing with and are dealing with more and more um, in the future. I think the, the biggest issue that we see is client mobility. Clients are um, a generation or two ago, people were born in a place, they lived in that place and they died in that place. And now um, it's hard to think that clients will even stay in one place for a number of years, much less a lifetime. And the ability to travel across borders is significant, state borders and um, uh, international borders as well. So it raises a lot of interesting questions and we're grateful um, that Steve will be here. I will take this opportunity also to, to mention and uh, introduce Steve as the co-head of the Private Wealth Services Group um, with Kristen Hager. We're lucky to have um, his leadership on this topic and um, lots of topics. We do have one little shift to make, which is Steve is going to come to this end of the table for the presentation. So he gets the camera, which I'm glad for. And so while we're doing that, I'll thank uh, Farhan and Abby again for your participation and a really um, good but sobering um, uh, presentation on the rules to come. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'm Steve Murphy, and I think in a moment, there we go, the camera will zoom in on me. Um, as you know, as Bill mentioned, I'm here in the Charlottesville office in our Trust and Estates group. And this topic today is on what we call international estate planning. We'll get to that topic in, um, and, and sort of unpack that in a moment. But first, again, I want to sort of echo Bill's comments um, of, of thank you, of, of all the work um, that went into these presentations. Our marketing team is just fantastic. So I want to just echo this, this thanks. I mean, there's so much work that goes into these uh, presentations, both here, um, Farhan and Abby there at the table, but then other, other people behind the scenes. And it really couldn't be possible without all their work. It's also really sort of sobering or humbling to think about just the years that McGuire Woods has been putting on these presentations in various venues all over the country. And I was, um, it was really great to see our earlier presentations this year in Charlotte. You know, presentations on cryptocurrency by our colleague Sabrina Conyers and Laura Mezer, and fiduciary litigation. Michael Barker gave some great presentations on cases there, and Andrew Shamakis some presentations on doing some estate planning in this type of environment with high inflation, um, in this type of market environment. And then going to Richmond, uh, Ben Camlin gave a great presentation on federal and Virginia um, updates for trusts and estates. Our colleague John Woolard gave a great presentation on fiduciary litigation. Um, and so here in Washington, D.C., what we try to do is, again, think of some topics that our clients and colleagues here in this environment are really dealing with. And so international estate planning was a topic that really came to mind, again, given the mobility of people. We'll, we'll sort of unpack that a little bit more um, as we go through this. Now, I'll say that we did choose this topic or this a title of international estate planning, but um, sort of as a teaser of things we'll talk about later in this presentation, that might not be the best way to think about it or the best title, but it's really how people in our industry think about this topic, so we use that topic, but we'll talk about how that might be a little bit of a misnomer. So what I'm going to do is start flipping through these, and Farhan, as I do, maybe you can you know, keep me honest if I go too far, I'll, uh, you can help me. There we are. So here's our agenda. Um, so this is really how I think I or our group approach this topic of international estate planning. There's lots of different ways to approach it, lots of different strategies. Uh, but as we'll see, one way that we approach it is almost that uh, because of the mobility of clients and, our, and, um, and, and these entities, we're already probably doing a lot inter of international estate planning. Or maybe you're doing more than you realize. And so we're going to try to unpack some of those concepts. Um, and we'll also try to uh, help to demystify this topic. A lot of clients and practitioners find it very intimidating and for lots of reasons. 
Um, but you know, again, try to demystify that and talk about what are some ways that we, how, how do we approach this with our clients and help, again, educate them about some of these issues and walk them through this process. So here's our agenda, again, how we might approach this. Just some basic principles. We'll flag a couple areas of complexity. We'll then summarize the U.S. transfer tax system, which is a review for many of you, but it's important to keep in mind here. We'll focus on um, citizenship and domicile, what those concepts mean. And then maybe as one specific topic, we'll talk a lot about the rules for spouses, when one spouse is a U.S. citizen or not, or U.S. resident or not. We'll talk about what those concepts mean. And then maybe a pitfall or a trap of foreign trust. And then lastly, some issue spotting. So one of my one of my favorite um, aspects of all these presentations that we give is just to give recognition to some of our colleagues who did a lot of work on the substance. Um, and it was great to to hear uh, Bill talk about some of our other colleagues doing this work and who've been doing this work for years. But I, I really want to um, emphasize just a couple of colleagues who've done a tremendous amount of work in helping prepare these materials. So so that's me right there, uh, Steve Murphy. Um, I'm here in the Charlottesville office. Uh, I'm also licensed, licensed in D.C., and I come up to D.C. a fair amount, but just because of our schedule, I wasn't able to be there with you in person up there in D.C. Um, and then some contributors, Skip Fox. I mean, just sort of a legend in our area and our group, a great mentor and colleague who's now really enjoying his retirement. Um, he's done a lot of work in preparing some of these materials and also teaching and mentoring us in some of these concepts and also how to approach them with clients. Danny Burness, a colleague who really put a lot of work into these, all these presentations, especially some of these really snazzy charts that we'll see. And then Hunter Glenn, an associate in our Trust and Estates group and here in our Charlottesville office, we really can't use enough superlatives to talk about Hunter. She's sharp, energetic, uh, very personable, but she's done a lot of work on some of these concepts as they come up with our clients. So again, I, I, I really want to pause and thank her for her contribution to some of these materials also. So here we are with the growth of what we call international estate planning. Um, and, and again, maybe that mobility of people is a good way to approach this there on the right of this, this chart. Uh, just people are moving from different jurisdictions, different countries. And so you might have connections that arise between the U.S. and other countries. So here, looking on the left, U.S. persons investing in foreign property. What's, what are some implications there for their estate planning? How about foreign persons investing in U.S. property? And then how about ta uh, concerns about tax and information compliance? Gosh, there's a whole slew of rules and reporting requirements we want to be aware of and help to spot, our, spot for our clients. So the first question might be, what, do, what is international estate planning? And what do we really mean by international law? So this is what I meant when I say that maybe international state planning isn't the best title for this presentation or the best title for the type of planning that we do. And the reason for that is international law really developed of, of uh, how countries interact with one another, really almost in the space between. So the rules of uh, diplomats, pirates, also the, you know, the law of shipwrecks in international waters. So that's often we think of international law, um, and just historically that's built up, and one main body of law for international law is actually treaties between these countries. But maybe instead we should be thinking about this not as international estate planning, but as multinational estate planning. That is, estate planning that takes place when an individual has connections to different nations, not necessarily that takes place in, the, in those connections or in that area between those nations. Think of that distinction. And, and maybe an example might help to underscore that, underscore the role of these practitioners and advisors. You, know, you might think of um, estate planning just in the U.S. I don't think I would ever say that I'm doing interstate estate planning, but I think I would regularly do multi-state estate planning. So think of an example of that. You might have a client in Washington, D.C. A resident of Washington, D.C. pays income tax in Washington, D.C., they might have a vacation home in Connecticut, and then they might want to retire or spend some time in Florida. Well, each of those jurisdictions have separate rules on estate tax, income tax, residency requirements, and also just things as basic as the transfer of property. Um, 
So the practitioner should advise that client of some of the complexity that comes along with this multi-state presence in these different jurisdictions and help guide them along. So similarly, I would approach it with international estate planning. This is about not sort of a, a client who's international, but a client who has connections to very specific nations. And so how do we help the client navigate that and, and as we'll see, sort of build the right team around those issues? So again, could we mean multinational law? So here's some multinational scenarios. Maybe a U.S. citizen marries a non-U.S. citizen. Maybe a U.S. citizen has foreign family or foreign assets. We'll talk about some of those tests. Maybe a foreign citizen starts to have U.S. family or U.S. assets. Or maybe a blended multinational family has foreign and U.S. connections. So again, thinking about breaking that down, how do these different jurisdictions address some of these issues and then how can we as advisors really make sure we're guiding the client in the right way? So maybe like international estate planning, or you know, like any estate plan, this is, um, the, or international estate planning is really like any other estate plan. And so again, we want to demystify this for the client. What are our overall goals? I really am a big fan of taking one big step back. What are our really goals here? Well, we want to transfer property during life or upon death to the desired recipient. Along the way, we want to reduce or manage tax and other liabilities. We also want to ensure assets are used for the appropriate purpose. And I'll just pause there for a moment and say that with the current tax environment, with the estate tax exemption so high and with the availability of portability, we find that a lot of clients really value trust planning because of the asset protection that it provides. So it may be that trust and long-term trusts are no longer necessary for estate tax, but maybe they're more important for asset protection to protect those assets from creditors of beneficiaries over time and make sure those assets are used for the right purposes. Now, those issues of credit protection are likely grounded in individual state law or maybe a jurisdiction's law. But again, it's important to think about that. That's a goal we should make sure we're addressing even in this international or multi multinational context. And then lastly, again, helping the client identify what are those goals and what might be some obstacles they have to achieving those goals. And one thing we would like to um, emphasize early on with a client is the presence of these multinational issues increases the complexity. And I like to bring that up from the very beginning. Um, if the client has properties in various jurisdictions, if the client's residency or citizenship status might be more complicated, then I like to just bring that up from the very beginning. This is going to be more complicated. I'm going to help advise you through that. Um, but again, it's really helpful to set the client's expectations. I would never have, want to have a situation where we put in place a plan or a strategy and the client gets a much bigger bill or lots more you know, complexity and they don't understand why. So from the very beginning, I like to say, okay, if we're going to do this, these are the sorts of ways we're going to address this, but this is how your status increases complexity. I had a great conversation with a client recently where one client, one spouse was a U.S. citizen. The other spouse was not. And as I talked through some of these issues, the, the non-U.S. citizen spouse said, would it just be easier if I was a U.S. citizen? And I could tell him very clearly, yes, it would be. That doesn't mean he has to become a U.S. citizen. That's a big decision, lots of personal and other reasons to, to think that through. But as they're considering that, maybe they should think about citizenship status as, again, int introducing some complexity, maybe something they could address. All right. Um, I just love this overall discussion of some of these key issues. So we're going to talk today about tax compliance and planning, income tax and transfer tax, especially from a U.S. perspective, especially how does the U.S. tend to tax some of these multinational connections or entities during life, upon death, and then following death or following transfer. And then similarly with a property transfer, you might use U.S. and foreign wills or other donative instruments, and there's also U.S. and foreign transfer tax regimes. So I know we showed that really nice orderly chart and issue spotting early on, but sometimes international estate planning sort of looks like this to the client or to the advisor, just a jumble of issues. Oh my gosh, so many issues flying around here of different size and relevance. Um, individuals inheriting property, um, cross-border gifts, this concept of a QDOT, which we'll get to, 
immigration and expatriation planning and advising the client along the way. So just lots of issues, lots of things to be thinking about. And we'll talk through a number of those today, but again, not all of them. And you know, you might think that these are really overwhelming concepts, but I think you're already familiar with many of them. And you might already be advising clients about many of them. So again, maybe what are some key things we want to cover today is demystify this, these concepts, learn to issue spot. Also find your level of comfort with these issues in relationships. Maybe that's another reason we want to flag these issues early on in the relationship so that if this is the complexity that you're not comfortable taking on or advising the client on, well, then you can tell the client early on, again, as opposed to getting in a situation months down the road where some issue arises and you say, you know, I'm not sure if we're comfortable with that. And what I really like to do here is build the right team of advisors, um, especially in our case uh, of estate planning, making sure we have that team around us. That's going to include investment advisors. There are any number of issues that are going to arise with investing in foreign corporations and also tax issues. We want investors who understand some of these issues at least enough to help us think through the best way to, to invest these assets. Certainly, we want good advisors for tax compliance. We're, we're going to go through a few examples of tax compliance for multinational issues, and you want advisors who are very familiar with those. And again, also advisors who know how to issue spot and maybe um, you know, bring on other experts for that tax compliance. Tax planning, that's often where we, where we uh, come into play here of transfer tax and income tax planning and put in place the right structures. But then also other, other members of the team. What about things like just property transfer? Foreign probate could be a really tricky um, issue. You know, I, I would never presume to be an expert on some other country's probate laws. So it's important to have the right type of uh, team that is going to understand those issues. If you have a client that has a vacation home in Panama, well, how do they make sure that that property is transferred in the right way upon their death? We're going to need good advice of some of those mechanical steps. We also don't want to forget about corporate counsel. Corporations uh, are, might, be, might operate very differently in some of these other jurisdictions, so bring on that corporate counsel too. Um, and I, I skipped a reference to trust. Maybe a broader comment that I could say is just keep in mind that lots of countries don't even recognize trusts. So you might even have an issue where an, a beneficiary of a trust moves to another jurisdiction, like many of the civil law countries in Europe, who just simply don't recognize trusts as an entity. Well, gosh, how, how does that affect the beneficiary status of the trust and the trustee's duties? So again, understanding all these concepts. But I also don't want to forget the non-tax planning, maybe some cultural or relationship issues. That can be incredibly important, too, in these multinational families. And that might go beyond really the scope, the technical expertise that we're providing, but we don't want to forget it. And maybe one comment that I'll have here is just about culture and about how different, uh, you know, different cultures might approach this process in different ways. And I'll give you an example. In the U.S., it is pretty common for attorneys to bill based on an hourly rate. It is also pretty common that attorneys will give an estimate of the fees, but then the, that estimate might change over time. You might have a retainer that is drawn down and the person uh, you know, increases that or, or re-ups that retainer. Now, I'm not trying to say that clients love the idea of paying attorneys by the hour or tax professionals by the hour, but it's a common concept. And I'm also not saying that, that clients love the idea of increasing estimates of the project and scope of work. But again, it's a familiar concept. Um, Keep that in mind as you're thinking about this, the structure and the relationship early on. There are many cultures where uh, that estimate of fees is really not how they approach it. They might look at that estimate of fees as basically a flat fee. This is going to be the dollar amount. Um, or if you keep billing them, they just might not understand these sort of ongoing bills at an hourly rate. Um, and then lastly, keep in mind the difficulty of enforcing some of these fees against some people who are in other countries. So that, that person in this other country might have a very practical solution of not paying the bill, of just simply saying, okay, well, you're not, I'm not subject to a U.S. accord, and so I'm just not going to pay that bill. Now, I only bring that up to say this is another reason very early on to just caution your, your colleagues, your advisors, uh, and the client about just different ways you're going to approach it 
to make sure everyone's on the same page, you've got the right team around you, we've spotted all the issues, and then we can move forward in a really productive way. Um, looks like there's a whole, there's a, um, a bunch of stuff missing from this slide. Um, pause for a moment. But I, I worry that if I go to this next slide, it, I'm going to uh, lose on this. But yeah, here we go. All right. Here are some topics you should know about, but we're not going to cover. So these are just some topics. And gosh, this is just an example of how this sphere can be so overwhelming. Here on this slide, we're just going to talk about a number of issues you should be thinking about if for tax compliance. So on the right, CFCs, not chlorofluorocarbons, but controlled foreign corporations. PFIX is a passive foreign investment company. Guilty, I love that one. Global intangible low tax income and the Foreign Act Tax Compl Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. So just sort of the alphabet soup here. And um, one of the one of the things that I uh, have a great privilege of doing is teaching courses at UV Law School. And when I talk to my students about these concepts, I say these are very complex concepts. They can be very overwhelming. Let's just start by putting some of these concepts on the board. And you're going to hear them several times. And over time, they'll become more familiar. And in fact, I remember when I was a summer associate talking to Bill Sanderson about GRATS. And Bill told me the same thing. He said, gosh, GRATS is a very overwhelming concept, but just work with it long enough. And just you know, understand you have a lot to learn. Eventually, these concepts will all sort of fit, uh, fit together. So I would approach the same thing. We're going to talk about a lot of um, concepts on this slide, just very briefly, but again, just to familiarize yourself with those. So on the left there, how about expatriation and covered expatriate rules? So if a client wants to leave the U.S., what are the tax implications of that? As a reminder, under the current tax regime, leaving the U.S. doesn't trigger estate tax. Instead, it triggers what's called an income tax, which is a, or an exit tax, which is essentially paying capital gains on those assets before leaving. They file a very specific form, Form 8854, upon leaving, and there's a process you would go through in order to leave the U.S. Now, I'll just comment that when you expatriate, it's important to see that, obviously, see that coming from a while away. Um, and there are jokes made in the media now about people wanting to leave the U.S. because of the current political climate. Well, they, there are a number of our clients who are thinking about that as a possibility. And what I like to do is walk through with them, what are the steps that would need to be taken in order for you to actually leave the U.S. for tax purposes? And what are the consequences of that? And how can we plan ahead? Uh, and again, getting that whole team around so everyone understands if you do decide to leave the U.S. for tax purposes, what's that going to look like and how we're going to plan accordingly. Uh, and one, you know, one little tip is uh, sometimes with this exit tax, it looks like you're triggering capital gain, but it might not operate the same way as if you actually trigger capital gain. So what a number of advisors do is they suggest you would just uh, sell all your assets, file a final income tax return, report the capital gain. That way you can clearly take deductions and the like. You get to step up in basis. And then you essentially leave the U.S. with just cash. Um, and then covered expatriate rules. There are rules that if you leave the U.S., then you're called a covered expatriate. And then if you make gifts back to U.S. persons, that triggers gift tax. So, you know, again, a lot of these rules are structured around making sure people can't just step outside of the U.S. tax regime, but then still benefit people and, and corporations like within the U.S. So that's one theme we'll have here. Um, here on the bottom left, the resident status in non-U.S., We've talked before about treaties. Treaties are going to be incredibly important in, uh, in thinking about multinational estate planning. I'm going to see if this puts up our next slide. All right. Well, this is great. I mean, here's another example of just sort of the magic of PowerPoint. Our great marketing group has put together this really neat um, way of phasing in this information to not put up a really busy slide. So in that middle column, starting from top to bottom, we've got Form 8621, which is an information return uh, for a PFIC, a passive foreign investment company. So he here's a comment about PFICs. Um, these, this tax regime really is set up in a way to make sure people can't take advantage of what the IRS calls a tax gap. And in fact, on the IRS website, they talk about tax schemes uh, where 
people are out there trying to suggest that you can just very easily step outside of the U.S. tax regime, generate income and the like, and then sort of move right back in. And it certainly is not that easy. Um, with a PFIC, if you are an owner of, certain, of, of a certain foreign company, then if a distribution from that company comes to you as a U.S. person, then there is a very complicated way that that is taxed as income to you. And maybe the summary is that if you've been an owner of this company for five years and it's never made a distribution to you, then you are not taxed on that during years one through four. But then in year five, when the PFIC makes a distribution to you, there starts to be catch-up distributions where the income earned by the company in years one through four is taxed to you on, under very complicated rules. And you can see, how, you see why this starts to make sense. We, uh, the IRS wouldn't want to allow someone to set up, or Congress wouldn't want to allow someone to set up a foreign company, generate lots of income outside the U.S. tax regime, and then make distributions back to the owners without that income tax. So it's a very complicated sort of catch-up regime. You can do something called a qualified electing fund, or QEF, or QEF, where from the very beginning you elect to be taxed on that income over time. Here's just another example of how understanding these concepts can be really helpful for your client early on spotting some of those issues. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all these other uh, forms, but maybe this is just a good, um, now it's not alphabet soup, it's number soup of all the issues that might arise. Um, F bar is another example of, right there, form uh, 115. Um, F bar is in the news, the foreign bank account reporting. Here. All right. So um, we're going to talk now just very briefly about the U.S. transfer tax. So again, if we think about this as multinational tax planning, we want to think, how does the U.S. transfer tax apply to someone who is, uh, a, a, who's in the U.S., who has connections to the U.S., maybe a U.S. citizen or U.S. resident, or someone who's outside the U.S., a non-citizen, non-resident? How do these, these rules apply? So... Um, We'll talk a little bit more about some of these exemption amounts, but by way of review, the US audience would know that there is a federal estate tax. That's a very high exemption right now, um, 12.06 million for 2022, and then 9 point, or 12.92 million for 2023. We'll talk about those numbers in a moment. And then after you go over that exemption, the estate tax is levied at 40%. Uh, there is also a gift tax. A federal gift tax of gifts made during life, and as you make gifts during life, that U.S. citizen or U.S. resident would draw down that exemption so they have less exemption to use upon death. And then lastly, a topic that I really enjoy presenting on, the generation skipping transfer tax or GST tax, which applies additional layers of transfer tax to, uh, to generation skips, to transfers uh, two or more generations below the transferor. All those transfer taxes continue to apply in the multinational context. So the first question that we would have is, who is subject to this U.S. transfer tax? In the case of a donor during life or a testator upon death, if you are a U.S. citizen, then all of your property throughout the world that you can essentially control is included in your gross estate for estate tax purposes and is subject to U.S. estate tax. That is different than the way many other countries treat uh, estate tax or treat as taxable estates. The U.S. taxes all worldwide property. But again, if you're a U.S. citizen, you have that estate tax exemption, currently very high, $12.06 million for 2022. If you are a U.S. domiciliary, and we'll talk about that term and why we use that silly term domiciliary rather than resident, uh, again, you're taxed on all your worldwide property, but you would have that same estate tax exemption. If you are a non-citizen, non-domiciliary, NCND, then you uh, would only have to pay estate tax on certain U.S. situs property. And we'll get to some of those specifics in a moment. Now, I think I have another really snazzy slide here. First category is if you're a U.S. citizen. So again, just sort of uh, fleshing this out a little bit more. For U.S. gift tax purposes, there's U.S. gift tax on any worldwide assets, any assets that you give. But you have these annual exclusions, $16,000. 
that exemption will be $17,000 in 2023. The, exempt, the inflation adjustment just came out. Uh, you have a, a 12.6 lifetime exemption from estate tax. I think it's 12.06. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a mistake. It should be 12.06, right, of uh, lifetime exemption from estate tax. That is going to be $12.92 million in 2023. Um, and then again, U.S. estate tax on your worldwide assets. And importantly, as a donee, if you're a U.S. citizen and you receive property from your spouse, there is an unlimited marital to deduction. And then there's the GST tax, the same exemption. What if you're a U.S. resident? And we'll talk about what residency means in a moment. It's a very subjective type test. If you're a U.S. resident, then actually the same types of rules apply. U.S. gift tax on your worldwide assets, any gift of those assets, annual exclusion, lifetime exemption. Um, but then as a donee, there is not an unlimited marital deduction. So if you are a U.S. resident, non-citizen spouse, and you receive property from your spouse, you can only receive $164,000 without the transferor spouse starting to use gift tax exemption or, or uh, trigger and gift tax. Now, that also will be um, updated for inflation to $175,000 in 2023. Okay, what if you are a non-resident alien? What if you are a non-citizen, non-resident? The rules are very different. Notice how for U.S. citizens and U.S. residents, there's just that little tweak about the marital deduction. For non-resident aliens, the, 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 uh, the rules are very different. So there's the U.S. gift tax, but only on U.S. CITUS assets, and that's a very small universe of U.S. CITUS assets, real property and tangible property in the U.S. There is an annual exclusion from gift tax, but there's no lifetime exemption. And then similarly, there, as a donee, there's that $164,000 marital deduction. Now, how about upon death? There's U.S. estate tax on U.S. CITUS assets plus certain intangible property. We'll talk about that in more detail later. But notice that exemption. That is not a typo. There's only a $60,000 exemption upon um, that individual's death. So if a non-citizen, non-resident dies owning property in the U.S. that's fit into certain categories, they can only transfer $60,000 free of any estate tax. That $60,000 is not adjusted for inflation. And then any remaining funds would trigger a state tax at 40%. That is a huge issue, and it's definitely something you want to advise your clients on for those non-citizens, non-residents. Here we have another fancy slide that's showing phasing in a few of these things. Um, okay, so again, thinking about who is subject to these regimes, I mentioned before that for U.S. transfer tax, we call, call it a... a a domiciliary. And that's because the rules are very tricky about U.S. transfer tax. Now, for U.S. income tax, the rules of whether you're a U.S. resident are very mechanical, very mechanical. There's two tests of how you become a U.S. resident for income tax purposes. There's the green card test, and there's a substantial presence test. If you have a green card, you are a U.S. resident for income tax purposes and are taxed on your income. If, you, uh, if you're uh, don't meet the green card test, then you could still be taxed as a U.S. resident under what's called the substantial presence test, where you're present in the U.S. for at least 31 days, and the sum of all days for this year and the prior year equal or exceed 183 days. And those days are counted very, uh, you know, strictly, you know, uh, if you are transferring from one country to another and you only stop over in the U.S., that day isn't counted. There are certain health exceptions that also count as exceptions for uh, counting days. But as you can imagine, counting days can be really important to make sure that your client is or is not uh, a, a U.S. resident for income tax purposes. Maybe we'll go again to our, our comment about the person who might live in Washington, D.C. and spend time in Connecticut and Florida. There, that person might want to be a Florida resident for income tax purposes, and there they want to work with their advisors to make sure they have the right presence in Florida to trigger income tax there and not in D.C. So, again, a, a similar concept. Um, now, there is a, if you're under the substantial presence test, there is an exception 
called the closer connection test, where if you have a closer connection to another jurisdiction, then you're not a U.S. resident. But, you know, don't let all this long explanation get in the way of the summary, which is this is a very mechanical test if you are a U.S. resident for income tax purposes. Well, what about if you're a resident for U.S. Uh, transfer tax purposes? We'll get to that in a moment. Very subjective test. And maybe a takeaway is that it's possible for you to be a, a uh, U.S. person for income tax purposes and subject to U.S. income tax, but not subject to U.S. transfer tax and vice versa. So, again, flagging this for the client early on that this is going to be a complex type of analysis and it might not be as easy or as clear as, as they think. Here we are. So for purposes of U.S. transfer tax, we use a concept called domicile. If you are a U.S. citizen, then you are treated as a, a U.S. citizen under the rules. But how do you how are you treat as a U.S. resident for transfer tax purposes? Well, it's based on your domicile, um, and um, this is a very subjective test. And under the Treasury regulations, what this means is you're living in the U.S. without a present intention of leaving at some later time. You might really want to make sure that your client does qualify as a U.S. domiciliary because then they get that high estate tax exemption um, for all their assets that are in the U.S. Or you might want to make sure that your client does not qualify as a U.S. US domiciliary so that uh, they don't, they're not, don't have to pay uh, estate tax on all their worldwide assets. But again, it's a very subjective test, and that might be a surprise to you or to other advisors or clients because we often think of that test as so easy to satisfy. Well, again, in the multinational context, it might get much more complicated. Some of the factors that might go into whether you're a U.S. domiciliary are the length of time that you're in one, air, one jurisdiction or another, the size, the cost, and the nature of your various residences. You know, how big is your house in the U.S. versus the uh, house elsewhere, the location of family and friends, or personal belongings. Um, those are some also some factors that are borrowed from the U.S. income tax context. But you can imagine if someone's trying to show that they're not a citizen, not a resident for U.S. transfer tax purposes, the IRS might look and say, well, gosh, all your friends and family and personal belongings are in the U.S. So that could be a factor that suggests you are a U.S. domiciliary and therefore uh, all your worldwide assets are subject to U.S. estate tax. Your business interests might also be an important consideration. So if you've left the U.S. but you still have a lot of business interests in the U.S., again, the, US, the IRS could look at that as a factor. So again, showing the client early on that this is a sub subjective test and want to be careful about monitoring it can be really helpful. I also should say that uh, declarations of residency can also be really important for determining your um, tax status. And I always like to remind clients of that. You know, If you're going to take a position that you're not a, let's say, you're not a, uh, a resident of Washington, D.C. You might want to revise that will or that trust that says in paragraph one, I, so-and-so, a resident of the District of Columbia. Right? That might be a bad fact the IRS could point to. So we've talked about how the transfer tax applies to U.S. citizens and then to these U.S. residents, better term there, U.S. domiciliaries. And then what about those people who don't fit into those categories? NCNDs, non-citizen, non-domiciliary, or NCNR, non-citizen, non-resident. How does the estate tax apply? This is a huge and important issue and one that advisors should really know and be familiar with. Because again, with that very low exemption of $60,000, the client could have a tremendous amount of estate tax exposure just based on what assets they hold in the U.S. and how those assets are held. So I know this is a busy slide, but sort of walking through on the left, um, what are assets that are subject to U.S. estate tax? Well, U.S. real property. Okay, that maybe makes sense. That's assets that are clearly situst in the U.S., real property, dirt and buildings on dirt, as an old law professor used to say. Tangible personal property located in the United States. Um, now, that might seem like not too, uh, um, too large a, an, uh, an asset to worry about, but I'm going to um, cite a recent tax court case where there was um, an individual named Daniel Wildenstein, who was a famous art collector. And under the facts of this case in the tax court, he had an art collection that was um, 
located in the U.S. Um, upon his death. But the estate argued it was only in transit. It wasn't actually located in the U.S. Now, think about how this would apply. If it's located in the U.S., that tangible personal property, then that art collection is subject to U.S. estate tax. And the IRS said that there was actually $17 million of tax that was owed in that case. Um, meanwhile, if the, art, if the art's not located in the U.S., then it's not subject to that estate tax. And, and here, what the estate argued was that the art was only in transit. It was only for a period of time in the U.S., and then it was going to go back to France. Um, in, in this case, the U.S.-French tax treaty applied, and they were applying the rules of that treaty. So another reminder, these rules are all really nice, but look at that treaty whenever you're thinking about the multinational connections of your client. Um, certain intangible property, like stock in a U.S. corporation, U.S. marketable securities, mutual funds, partnership interests, and interest in trusts are also U.S. site as property that could trigger estate tax. And so think what that, that means. If, you, if your client owns stock in a U.S. company, you might think of that as sort of an example of just a global citizen owns stock in a U.S. company. That's likely U.S. site as property that would trigger estate tax at death. So think about how best to structure that and hold that. There's some other exceptions like debt obligations of a U.S. person. Um, now, um, as we walk through some of those examples, we might note what are some exceptions. And so here on the right, key exceptions. Again, remember the treaty. The treaty might overrule or provide clarification of some of these rules of what assets trigger estate tax or don't. One really important exception is cash on deposit with a U.S. bank. If the client owns cash on deposit with a U.S. bank, then that does not trigger estate tax, no matter how much cash there is. It could be millions of cash, but that does not, uh, is not treated as a U.S. situs asset. So the question comes, what is cash on deposit? And I like to remind uh, clients and advisors about this because this could really be a trap for the unwary. Cash on, the, on deposit is a very limited exception. The, re the regulations and some court rulings flesh this out, that it really means if someone has an enforceable right to that cash in an account in a depository institution. So sort of like a savings account might be an example, where that's cash on deposit. Meanwhile, what if that client is only temporarily holding cash in an investment account or in a money market fund in that investment account? Well, they might argue that that is not U.S. situs property, because that property looks a lot like cash. It just looks like cash on deposit. But the, the rules would say that that is actually in, uh, the assets in that mutual fund or um, in that investment account um, is U.S. situs property. And there have been cases here where advisors have faced liability because they held large amounts of cash for a foreign person in an investment account. Then the foreign person dies, and there's a state tax levied on that cash. And the executor of the estate argues, well, gosh, if you had taken the, that cash from the sort of you know, investment account sweep account and just moved that into a savings account or some other type of thing that qualifies as a deposit, we wouldn't owe all this estate tax. So again, being mindful of that. Um, now, also on this list, stock of a foreign corporation does not, is not a U.S. situs asset. So... Um, that, that could be an opportunity for what we sometimes call a blocker entity, where you might, instead of holding property outright, in which case it's U.S. situs property, maybe hold it in a foreign corporation, where then it meets that exception and does not trigger estate tax. That's a very complicated thing to do. You want to be very careful, get the right members of your team involved before you just move assets into that foreign corporation. But again, there might be options of holding that U.S. property without triggering that estate tax upon death. And then there's exceptions like portfolio debt. Um, and uh, one question that sometimes comes up is what about options? Options might not fit into any of these categories. But I think probably the best answer is that an option looks like intangible property that's enforceable against a U.S. company, if it's the options about a U.S. company. So it likely is um, U.S. site as property. So again, we want to be careful about you know, our multinational clients might hold all sorts of interesting interests. Want to think, okay, how do they fit into this? Maybe they don't fit as cleanly into this grid 
And so how can we think of, uh, advise them about what their potential tax liability would be? And again, you know, I sort of hate to say it, but consider the liability for not managing these categories in that way. Again, you could really trigger a uh, uh, significant estate tax on that individual's death. Um, I want to think for a moment about when to bring up this one topic. And I I'm going to go ahead and bring it up now. <clears throat> Even though we don't have a slide on it, it's something that we 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 help advise our clients about uh, on uh, really regularly, and that's something called a foreign transfer certificate. So, what happens if you're an institution that um, is holding property for a foreign person? How do you turn that property over to the estate of the foreign person? Well, um, you may face significant estate tax liability if you do just turn it over to the wrong person. So the code provides that the person who is responsible for the estate tax is the executor. And the executor is defined in the code and the regulations as that uh, person who holds, who is a U.S. appointed executor, personal representative, or someone who is in constructive uh, uh, control of those assets. So maybe the takeaway is if there is a U.S. executor appointed in what, District of Columbia or Virginia, then that institution can turn over the funds to that U.S. executor. In fact, if they didn't turn over those funds, then they might face some complaints or maybe some liability because they might be seen as unreasonably withholding those funds. Um, but what if there is no U.S. executor that's been appointed? Well, in that case, that financial institution holding those assets might be deemed to be the executor for estate tax purposes, which means they have to pay the estate tax. So imagine this nightmare scenario. The bank or the investment house might hold this large investment account, and the executor in another country says this person's passed away, we'd like those funds, and the investment account, uh, house just moves those funds and transfers them to you know, country X. Well, now those funds are gone. What if those funds were U.S. Citus assets that triggered estate tax liability at 40%. Well, the IRS might come calling, but now the financial institution doesn't have the money. And even worse, because there was no U.S. executor serving, they are deemed to be the executor that has to pay that estate tax. This is the reason why a lot of institutions are very careful about turning over funds upon one of these multinational individuals' deaths. They want to make sure that they haven't sent all the funds elsewhere and are left with that liability. So what do you do if you're a, uh, a, an institution um, that is holding some of these assets for a foreign individual? You can go to the IRS and get something called a foreign transfer certificate, or an FTC. My colleague Brad Rydell Hoover is really you know, good at navigating some of these rules. And we work with you know, banks and other institutions all the time about addressing some of these issues. So you go to the IRS and get a federal transfer certificate. And once you get that, then you can transfer those funds to the next recipient and not worry about that lingering estate tax liability. There's a great resource on federal transfer certificates and some of these rules, in fact, all these rules, and it's actually the IRS website. I, I, I say that all the time. I'm, I'm actually amazed at how much information they have online. And maybe one reason they have so much information online is they're trying to caution individuals to not fall into one of those tax schemes that deal with what they, they call tax gaps. Um, that this is much more complicated. That it's not, you know, that you can't just avoid tax by, you know, transferring assets one way or the other. Uh, so, get the tra foreign transfer certificate or federal transfer certificate. If the assets are below the filing threshold, if they're below sixty thousand dollars, then you can just apply to the IRS to get a federal transfer certificate. And you actually have to uh, provide a lot of information when you when you uh, file. Um, you have to provide a copy of the last will and testament a translation if one's available. You have to provide uh, other tax filings that have filed overseas. So there's a lot of information that you provide to the IRS. And the IRS website says it takes six to nine months to get that federal transfer certificate. So, you know, again, this is something to very early on tell the client about. Or if you're a financial institution, something very early on to warn the decedent's estate about. Is you're not making this up, there are these very specific strict requirements and let's make sure we walk through the right procedures to make sure that you know we're providing for any estate tax and you know sort of everyone is protected. 
Now, if the assets are over that $60,000 threshold, there's a different type of filing. It's not a federal transfer certificate that you would get asked for immediately. You actually form an, you file an estate tax return. The normal estate tax return for a U.S. citizen or resident is called a 706. This is called a 706NA, which I think stands for non-resident alien. Um, it's only a two-page document, but it's got a lot of the uh, information that we would um, that we would expect in a, a 706. But what's interesting about the 706NA is you actually have to list the gross estate of the individual and their worldwide assets. When you think about clients who value their privacy and are concerned about maybe the U.S. government or other governments or anyone really getting information about their um, their assets – you know, that could be a real concern of theirs. So again, avoiding the even filing the form 706 NA might be something you can help your client with. The 706 NA also has uh, asked the question if there's a safe deposit box, which I always find fascinating. That's always like the last question that we ask to our clients as we're filing 706. Oh, by the way, could you tell us was there a safe deposit box? And I actually don't know why that's such a separate important question on the 706, but it's there on the 706 NA too. I feel like it's probably there just as a reminder, or maybe so the IRS is, um, you know, knows are, are you likely to be hiding anything in that safe deposit box. There's also the um, U.S. generation skipping transfer tax, and that does apply in the same way of transfers during life and upon death to this type of U.S. site as property. It basically applies if there's gift or estate tax levy. Okay, so things to be thinking about here again, and there's lots of risk and liability in a lot of these issues. The ownership and the situs of property. You know, as you're working through the, the list of property with your client, what are those assets? And maybe getting very granular in how those assets are held. Um, current and future domicile. How about U.S. gift tax, U.S. estate tax? And then are there ways to manage that ownership? to serve the client's goals, but also to reduce or eliminate that estate tax um, liability. So there are some of these estate tax blockers or these sort of entities that might help us, might, I should say, might and might help us uh, address or manage some of that liability. Foreign corporations could be an example of that. Uh, we'll get to foreign trusts in just a moment. Okay, transfers by spouses is a separate issue that we want to cover. And... Um, Bill, am I going until uh, noon? I'm going to 12.05, and then we'll take a break. Um, so transfers by spouses. So marriage between citizens of different countries is just one of those areas of complexity that I feel like as you're getting to know that client early on, it's just something to flag for them. Um, sort of as a side note, that marriage is important, also that citizenship is important. And I've got to remind myself that early on, you should really ask all your clients, are you a U.S. citizen? And I think we could sort of fall into a trap of assuming someone who, you know, culturally or with their name suggests that they have origins in a different country. Well, there are plenty of people who have those suggestions, but are U.S. citizens. And there are plenty of people who are U.S. citizens who don't have any of those indications. And so we always want to be careful to talk to all of our clients. And we as a firm have been thinking about, you know, what are the best ways to do that? You know, you could maybe bring that up with the client early on in an intake session or remind them on that about that uh, as they're making gifts and the like. And we'll get to why that's so important in a moment. So there is this overall tax policy in favor of transfers between spouses. That's called the marital deduction for gift tax and estate tax. So if a spouse transfers money to a U.S. citizen spouse, or a U.S. domicile, or, sorry, U.S. citizen spouse, then there is an unlimited marital deduction from estate tax. However, <clears throat> if that that uh, spouse is not a U.S. citizen, even if they're only a U.S. resident or domiciliary, there is not that unlimited marital deduction, and it's treated as if it's a gift to a non-spouse, and with the one exception of that hundred seventy uh, hundred sixty four thousand dollar gift tax exemption to non-citizen spouses, but otherwise it's treated as a gift to a non-spouse. Uh, there's an exception here for joint property. Maybe this is just flagging that 
for creation of certain joint tenancies in real estate that is, is not treated as a gift. Um, and maybe that's just a reminder that there's lots of technical rules here. So we want to remember to confirm the status of the marriage and do that early on. Um, we want to confirm the status of the citizenship and then also the status of the marriage. Um, and maybe we, in the interest of time, we, we'll skip over it, but there's an interesting recent case on a um, situation where someone had thought he uh, had been divorced from his prior spouse and had remarried, but the IRS argued that that remarriage was not valid, and therefore a large transfer to that new spouse did not qualify for the marital deduction. I, I'll say that um, this is probably also an important issue to think about with same-sex partners or same-sex spouses. And I think, uh, as just as an advisor, I need to get over any uncomfort or discomfort I might feel in asking someone, well, are you a U.S. citizen or with, with any couple? Are you actually legally married? Because, and what I try to do is just tell that, explain that to everyone and say, you know, because those types of classifications are going to be very important later on for our planning. So, you know, again, maybe during that discussion, they can suggest any complexities around their marital status or the like. But again, citizenship and marriage is probably something you really want to make sure you know about your client. If there is no, uh, if you're transferring assets to a non-citizen U.S. spouse, then upon death, those assets can still qualify for the marital deduction, but that's through something called a QDOT. It's a qualified domestic trust, and it allows this transfer upon death to not trigger state tax at the donor spouse's death. Instead, it triggers the state tax at the surviving spouse's death. And there are certain requirements. Um, here in this bullet, I put just as a shorthand that income has to go to the surviving spouse for life. I guess that's not technically true. This trust just has to otherwise qualify for the marital deduction. And then principal distributions, or I should maybe put taxable event distributions – trigger estate tax, other than for certain exceptions, like other than for hardship. So you could have this spouse, this non-citizen spouse, where income goes to the spouse during life. That income does not trigger estate tax during the surviving spouse's lifetime. But any principal distributions, other than for certain exceptions like hardship, would trigger estate tax. And there's a form, 706 QDT, that is filed that reports any of this and pays the estate tax. Um, and then because of these these issues of the the, print, the state tax being required, um, there's requirements about who can serve as the trustee. It has to be a U.S. citizen or, in some cases, a U.S. corporation. If the assets are $2 million or more, you have to have either a U.S. bank serve as a trustee or meet certain bond or letter of credit requirements. You know, it, it, it's interesting to think about why the QDOT uh, – exists as a strategy. You know, it's a much more complicated set of, uh, uh, you know, state plan to set up for clients just because one spouse doesn't have a, uh, is not a U.S. citizen. And I think it harkens back to the time when there was an estate tax type exit tax if you left the U.S. So I guess the concern would be of Congress that if you, if I have, a, if I'm married to a non-U.S. citizen spouse and I, I, I leave her all my all my funds um well that might qualify for the marital if that qualifies for the marital deduction i won't get a state tax at my death and then she'll take all those funds put them in a suitcase and then she'll leave to her maybe country of origin and never have to pay a state tax on those funds but a lot of these laws have changed there's now the exit tax which is based on income tax not, uh, not a state tax so i think there's this disconnect of how the q dot rules work versus the marital deduction but in any event it exists, and this is something to just mention the clients early on of this additional complexity. And so there are some exceptions and limitations. You cannot do a lifetime Q dot. You can do a lifetime Q tip, but not a lifetime Q dot to a non-U.S. citizen spouse. And then the surviving spouse's use of portability is limited in the case of a Q dot. And there's also limits on how the surviving spouse could maybe use um, the 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 SUI amount, the, the, the unused exemption that's been ported from the deceased spouse. Um, and there have been a couple of recent private letter rulings where people have forgotten to report to the IRS if the surviving spouse becomes a U.S. citizen. So maybe that's another example of where you, the client might say, we've got to file this, you know, file this QDOT form every year and pay estate tax on every distribution of principal, 
would it be easier if I just became a U.S. citizen? Maybe the answer is yes, at least in that in that in that instance. Um, and so again, lots of complexity here with uh, with Q dots, and it's helpful to get ahead of that early so the client doesn't think that you've you know just sort of building complexity on later on. How about some additional issues of transfers by spouses? Um, in the interest of time, I'll move through this pretty quickly. But um, there is portability of estate tax exemption and gift tax exemption. Upon a decedent's death, then the surviving spouse in certain cases, or the decedent spouse's estate, can take certain steps, can file an estate tax return, so the surviving spouse can pick up and use the unused estate tax exemption of the decedent spouse. And just sort of recall the stakes here. If someone dies this year, then um, you know you might ask, what happens to their $12 million estate tax exemption? If the decedent's estate or the surviving spouse takes certain steps, then they can pick up and use that unused exemption. Something we talk to clients about all the time, especially with clients might have estates that don't trigger estate tax. Do you file in order to get that portability? We also think about the timeline, too. Um, if an estate tax return is required, then you have to file within nine months or six months if uh, an exam extension is properly applied for. But importantly, in July, the U.S. or the, uh, the IRS issued Revenue Ruling 2022-32 that says that you now have five years to file that return for portability if an estate tax return was not otherwise required. Um, some practitioners think that's helpful. They can sort of you know, revisit it later. I think we would love to just get that addressed sooner rather than later in case someone doesn't forget. So a question often comes up, which decedent spouses can elect portability? So a U.S. citizen spouse can elect portability. A U.S. resident spouse, I think you probably can elect portability. And that's because the statutes provide an exception for portability for a non-resident, non-citizen. Maybe I did the other way around. Non-citizen, non-resident. So the exception is pretty narrow. Um, and then what surviving spouses can use portability? Again, I think a, non, a, a U.S. citizen spouse can use portability. A U.S. resident surviving spouse probably can use portability. And a non-U.S. citizen, non-U.S. resident cannot use portability. Um, I, I mentioned the issue of the probably because these are the sorts of issues you can flag for the client early on, and especially during the administration, so they understand to the extent the extent to which they could elect portability. And Bill, are you sure I go till twelve oh five? To wind up. <clears throat> Whenever you're ready. All right. Tells me I can wind up. Um, so, um, and I could go all day. For the record. Um, so, you know, gift splitting, another issue, another very powerful tool, but U.S. citizen spouses certainly can elect to gift split. U.S. resident spouses, I think the answer is, you know, pretty clearly, yes, they can elect to gift split, but there's some suggestions out there that maybe they can't, or some practitioners are a little bit careful about that. And this is another issue I like to flag for the client, so they, they don't think I'm, you know, doing additional research for no reason. And that's why I say this remains somewhat in doubt. So again, before splitting gifts, you want to consult with tax advisors. And here's another, you know, cautionary tale. Before moving assets between spouses, check that citizenship. And check the marriage. If they're a U.S. citizen spouse, they could transfer $12 million to the other spouse and not pay any, any gift tax or not use any gift tax exemption. But if they're not that U.S. citizen spouse, then that would use gift tax exemption. And you'd hate to have a scenario where that transfer has happened, and then you're realizing it later, and now you've got an issue. Um, so here's another just summary of what all these different um, exemptions and, and dollar amounts are. And the inflation adjustments have come out. And if you want to look at those inflation adjustments, there's a revenue ruling. Um, it's paid as long. I love looking through and seeing all the different things. There's also an um, increase in the amount of uh, tax due for a manufacturer or importer of certain aero shafts, uh, which is now 59 cents a shaft, if you guys are paying attention. Um, these are the sorts of things tax lawyers love to look through. Um, one last comment is about foreign trust, sort of a pitfall. If something is a foreign trust, then there's additional complexity, tax reporting, and tax liability. And there are common examples or traps of a foreign trust, like removal. If you give a foreign person the right to remove and replace trustees, 
that could be a foreign trust. Even if you think of it as a normal DC or Virginia trust, that's now a foreign trust that triggers all sorts of additional uh, reporting requirements. Or even naming a trust protector who is a foreign person, again, could make it a foreign trust. Again, maybe a trap for the unwary, maybe something you issue spot early when that client says, I would love to have my brother who lives in, you know, uh, in the Philippines be the person who can oversee this trust and remove and replace trustees. You might say, hmm, I'm not sure. That might make it a, a foreign trust. So here at the, at the end of this presentation, we've got a couple of just reminders of some important things to issue spot. And maybe the big takeaway is these rules are complicated. As these sorts of issues come up with the client, I like to flag them early, flag them often, and get that great team around you. All right, so thank you again so much. This is a real joy to, to present and be part of the um, these FAS seminars, the scouting report. I'm going to turn it back to Bill. Thank you. Um, we will take now um, a 15-minute break. Our plan is to leave the system up, uh, go on mute. We are going to come back in 15 minutes. We've just had two hours chock full of very intense um, rule-based and heavy material. And so um, you can shake that off, get a lunch, or, or just take a break. When we come back, it's going to be a little more exciting. Of course, we had the election just a few days ago, um, and so many things hang in the balance. We have two of our wonderful colleagues from the McGuire Woods Consulting Group who have been working hard to understand the impacts uh, of that, uh, the election and give us some insight uh, nationally and also focused on our area of interest. So uh, really encourage you to come back here in 15 minutes. We'll pick up at 12.15. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to, the clock just struck 12.15 on our computer here, and um, I'm going to introduce our uh, next presenters and welcome everybody back. Hope you have a sandwich or a cup of coffee. Um, really, this is a, a a, a great opportunity, and I want to thank Mona and Scott for being here. I imagine the last several days have been um, long and probably late nights for for all of you um, understanding and analyzing uh, what's just happened over the last week. Um, uh, for our, our uh, audience, Mona and Scott work in uh, our Washington, D.C. office in the Moir Woods Consulting Group. Um, they are um, experts in what we can sometimes call federal affairs, what's happening in Washington, D.C. And they come to uh, McGuire Woods both with deep and serious and real experience throughout the federal government and um, uh, the, the halls of power in Congress and in the executive branch where the laws are, are written and the rules are promulgated that we all have to follow. Um, they are not estate planning um, uh, experts, though they do have to learn and become experts on laws um, uh, all the time. So they are going to give us a broad update on what has happened um, uh, with the elections and where things might be going. Mona and Scott, I'm going to um, resist the urge to ask for predictions in ongoing races and things like that. And just really thank you again for being with us in what we know is a very busy time. I'm going to turn the floor over to you. We're, going to, we're scheduled to go till 1 o'clock, and then I'll wrap things up. And um, thank you so much. So I'll turn it over. Terrific. Well, uh, Bill, thank you again uh, so much for having us. We really appreciate it. Scott and I really appreciate being here. Um, you know, this is the nice thing about McGuire Woods Consulting and the law firm. We have this tremendous partnership where we work really closely together. So anytime Bill asks us to do something, of course, we say yes. Um, he was, don't let him kid you, he was yelling down the you know, Zoom the other day, what are the predictions? What do you think is actually going to happen? So I like he's being a little dismissive now, but that was clearly his interest a couple of days ago. Um, Scott and I work, as, uh, as Bill said, in our federal public affairs shop. We work very closely together. Um, we both happen to do a lot of work um, out in the states with governors and attorneys general and other state and local officials. That's very much our background, but we too both have 
federal experience. Uh, Scott was on the Hill working for uh, Congressman Price from Georgia, and I spent some time in the Clinton administration. So we have a nice balance of both policy and political experience, which will sort of inform this discussion today. Um, so again, super pleased to be here. It is, um, it's been a week, as Bill sort of alluded to. I don't think between us there was much sleep that any of us or anyone up on the uh, seventh floor got this week. A lot of activity, obviously, we're tracking and frankly still tracking. Um, and as uh, someone said on a call earlier today, there's no longer election day. That's sort of a misnomer now. Um, it's sort of election week election month and right. with Georgia now two times in a row going to the runoff in the Senate situation, it's almost the holiday season. <laughs> so uh, we like to sort of draw this out. Um, but I will start off by saying uh, if you were to believe everything you read and heard and if your only source of information was Twitter, you might have thought going into this weekend that it was going to be like the red wedding of Game of Thrones. I mean, the expectation of the losses for the Democrats was pretty aggressive. And, you know, I think there's been sort of this sort of underlying thought over the course of the, the season that the House was pretty much gone. I mean, I think that sort of a lot of times in Washington, those things become fait accompli. Someone's or some woman is dead man walking in their candidacy. And there was very much a sense that the House was gone. And then as we got closer to Election Day, not only was it going to be gone, but it was going to be gone by epic numbers, sort of like shellacking like in the in the uh, Obama time, right, when he got shellacked like 60 votes or 60 something. Votes. Um, so heading into the weekend, we heard all sorts of numbers, anywhere from 20 to 30 to 40 to and plus of where of how many seats that the Republicans would gain to take over the majority. And then as we headed into Tuesday, there was also, I don't honestly think, Scott, that we weren't really talking about the Senate, right? We knew it would be close, right. but there wasn't really sort of real discussions on, oh, there's a potential that the Senate could be gone too. But again, I think heading into this weekend, there was a little bit of panic, I would say, by a lot of folks in the National Democratic Party that not only did we have to worry about seats that we knew were going to be hard, uh, Catherine Cortez Masto, Democrat senator in Nevada, um, but that we were starting to worry about um, uh, Senator Hassan in New Hampshire. And at the point that they started worrying about Senator Murray in Washington, then you knew we had sort of hit pandemonium. And you know, I get it. There's a lot of in debate about polling and the legitimacy of various polls. You know, people really do think. But what it really comes down to is Election Day and letting the people of America decide for themselves who it is that they want to vote. That's the best poll that you could ever take is measuring what people do in early vote and on Election Day. So uh, where we find ourselves generally and Scott's going to get into the weeds a little bit is the Democrats, uh, you know, I think they overperformed. I think there was a real expectation, particularly in the House, uh, that, again, they would lose a large number of votes. You know, I think as it works out, it'll be less than 60, less than 30, less than 20. Um, there's some folks that think it may be very similar to what the Democrats have now, a couple of votes, maybe even less than um, you know, maybe even into single digits. Um, the Senate is an interesting story. We are uh, still, well, we're still waiting on Alaska, right. but those are two Republicans. So that person will end up caucusing uh, with the Republican Party. But there are still three outstanding Georgia, we know from yesterday, which will be moved into a runoff. So we'll know about that on December 6th. And then Arizona and Nevada are the two Senate seats, uh, Democratic incumbents. Any, whether the Democrats or the Republicans, whoever win two out of those three seats will be uh, in the majority. And if it is, uh, if the Democrats hold those two seats, at the very least, those two seats, they find themselves at 50-50 and, of course, have the vice president up the street who can come down and break ties. And there may be a scenario, Scott is a Georgian, so I have to be very careful how I say this, where the Georgia Senate race could be irrelevant for the purposes of who is in the majority. Um, if the Democrats win Arizona and uh, Nevada, it will be a different kind of race uh, about what the race between Senator Warnock and Senator, uh, a candidate for Senate, uh, Herschel Walker, will be. So 
big picture, Democrats uh, did better than okay. people thought, um, but it didn't stop the Democrats from being worry warts and concerned and that the sky is falling. And we'll talk about this a little bit later. I think it also very much has an impact on President Biden and sort of what his tenor is coming out of Tuesday, as opposed to how people framed him going in. So, Scott, if you want to talk a little bit more. Sure. Yeah. And, and thank you for, for having us. Um, it's a great opportunity to be with you. And thank you, Mona. That was a great table setting. Um, I think that did, did Republicans have a bad night? No, not necessarily. Um, did they have a good night? Not necessarily either. I think they failed to meet expectations. And Mona talked a lot about what those expectations were. I think that Unfortunately, going into the weekend, as Mona mentioned, you know, we were talking about Washington Senate and New Hampshire Senate races where perhaps we were overplaying our hand a little bit. And I think that perhaps if we would have um, you know, measured expectations a little bit better, um, I, there were those that were talking about 60 seat gains in the House. That was never going to happen. Um, but those that were talking about mid 20s weren't that far off from where I think we'll end up being. And so, as Mona mentioned, I'm going to go into a little bit more into the weeds on the House side as to where we are as of right now um, towards the Republicans majority. So as of early this morning, Republicans had won 207 seats. Democrats had 184 and 44 seats, uh, 44 seats had yet to be called. Um, and then. on track to take back the majority, but a much more narrow one, as I mentioned, than expected. So if you took look at these 44 House races that have yet to be called, 10 are truly toss-ups, 15 are likely or lean GOP, and 19 are likely lean or solid Democrat seats. And so if you're doing a quick math here, uh, if R's and D's split those toss-ups and then take all the races that are already in their column, that would mean that Republicans would hold a 227 to 208 seat majority, 19 seats, 20 seat gain. I think that based on the results that are in so far, it's a little bit generous to give Republicans half of the outstanding toss ups. So I think it'll, as Mona mentioned, it'll look very similar to the, the majority that uh, Democrats enjoy right now. So about 220 seats total, meaning that the Republicans picked up seats in the mid mid teens. And so, again, back to expectations, if your expectation was to pick up 60 seats and you end up with 15, that is disappointment. But if you're a little bit more realistic and, and thought we might gain 25, which I think most most folks that you know, really we're being honest. I think that's where we thought we would be. So um, obviously this will be a tight majority for Republicans in the House. Um, the leadership, because of that, will need to pay a little bit closer attention and more um, more often navigate some rabble rousers within their caucus. I do think that um, even with this tighter majority, um, the leadership races will still say that they will stay the same and are on track for kind of a uh, uh, as projected leadership races later in November, which we will go into in a minute. Can I just say one thing about the closeness of the House? I think what makes that interesting then is it means that everyone has a seat at the table, right? right. So you'll start to see a lot of um, there's not something where they can sort of run it through without the need of figuring out potentially bipartisan issues or even groups like um, the problem solvers who are a bipartisan group of uh, members of Congress who try to work together to find kind of a middle line on policy. So I think we'll see that groups like that, maybe less than folks on the ends on either party will have an outsized role in moving forward. No matter what the final number is, it's obviously it's going to be it's going to be close. And then um, if the you know, you want to talk for a minute, if the Republicans are able to take the Senate just generally. Right. Um, and then we can get, you know, actually, that sort of leads us nicely right. into what the leadership might look like. So as Mona mentioned earlier, there's obviously still a number of uh, states outstanding for, for Senate races. My home state of Georgia will be interesting. And then, of course, before that, Nevada and Arizona, therefore impacting what happens in Georgia. Um, if Republicans are successful and win uh, two of these, I think Senator Mitch McConnell would be uh, would, would be leader again. There had been some uh, you know conversation about um, others within the caucus, Rick Scott, um, potentially mounting a challenge. Most of those rumors have kind of subsided, and uh, 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 Senator McConnell has really uh, coalesced his his support. And so, um, unless something crazy happens, which is um, not impossible, uh, you'll see uh, a leader, Mitch McConnell, again. 
and uh, Senator Schumer was reelected on uh, Tuesday. So that puts him obviously in a good position to maintain um, his leadership role. So uh, whatever happens, um, it's sort of a continuity in a way, because you've got folks that have been in the leadership for a, for a long time. Right. And then uh, that's great. Yeah. So next, we wanted to cover, uh, you know, based on which way the Senate goes, where the Senate Committee on Finance leadership would be um, in on the Republican side. Senator Mike Crapo would be in a great position. He is the ranking member now. He joined uh, Finance Committee in 2005 and has been the top Republican on the committee uh, since 2021. So most expect this um, to fall in the way of uh, general order where the ranking member would then uh, uh, take over the committee. Great. And right now, current Senator uh, Ron Wyden is chair of the committee, um, also thankfully reelected on Tuesday. So, again, a bit of continuity on on the part in the Senate. Um, and given that it will be close regardless, I think we'll see a lot of opportunities for them to work together. But I mean, most of the action and most of the political attention, of course, is very much on the House. Right. Uh, a lot of interesting dynamics on what the leadership looks like. You've alluded to it a little bit, Scott, right. but do you want to start with Mr. McCarthy? Sure. Yeah, and as I mentioned, the you know leadership it, with the tighter majority, obviously leadership needs to be very keen to that uh, issue. Um, however, it's still likely that McCarthy will be speaker. And um, you know, St Steve Scalise told uh, Fox News and John Roberts yesterday uh, that not only would he not challenge Speaker McCarthy, but that he believes Speaker McCarthy has the votes to become speaker. Uh, and then just in, in due time yesterday afternoon, Scalise announced that he was going to run for majority leader. So those two seem to be uh, uh, pretty solidified. Um, of course, there is chatter amongst the House Freedom Caucus members and leadership that they had given a list of demands to uh, incoming Speaker McCarthy and that, you know, they wouldn't line up behind him without these rule changes to the House. Um, the issue with that is that McCarthy has shown in the past his willingness to acquiesce to conservatives demands in order to hold power. And then maybe even more important is that they don't have another candidate, not a House Freedom Caucus candidate for speaker or otherwise. And so without a, without a candidate, there's not much of a race. Um, interestingly, on the on the uh, House whip front, uh, there is a race. And so you have Jim Banks, who has been endorsed by former President Trump for that role. Uh, meanwhile, current Chief Deputy uh, Drew Ferguson from Georgia has a good deal of support uh, based on his current role. And then Chairman Tom Ember uh, was talked about and a front runner for this. He had been NRCC chairman. So the Re House Republicans campaign arm uh, leading that effort. Obviously, Tuesday was a little bit of a disappointment for him. So I think it's hurt his uh, standing in that race. And I think a lot of his support would then go over to Drew Ferguson. So an interesting one to watch there. Uh, uh, for, for House leadership. Uh, super interesting on the Democratic side, um, which is pretty incredible because the folks in the leadership have been in the leadership for 20 years. So obviously uh, Speaker Pelosi, um, Leader Hoyer of Maryland and Whip uh, Clyburn of South Carolina have all been in the leadership uh, for two decades. And um, what makes it interesting is I think if there truly had been a real wet red wave, excuse me, if there truly been a red wave, it would almost have been easier to predict what will happen in the future, because there would be very much a sense of that this group of leaders, particularly the speaker, have had their time, and it is time for sort of a new generation of Democrats to move into the leadership role. Uh, unequivocally, she's been an outstanding speaker. She's got both the political and the tactical and the legislative know-how to really be an effective leader. But I do think there's very much a sense that it is time um, for, as I said, sort of the next generation. And they've been in um, the leadership so long that we've actually lost a little bit of our bench of folks who were sort of, uh, sort of next in line, uh, folks like... Uh, Chris Van Hollen, who instead of sort of waiting his time in the House, sort of moved over, ran for the Senate in Maryland and actually got reelected on Tuesday. Um, Javier Becerra, who's a longtime California congressman who went home to California to be attorney general and is now back in D.C. as the HHS secretary. A lot of folks like that who were sort of primed to be the next round of leaders sort of didn't know when the end was coming and the opportunity. So they have moved over. But there are very much sort of a new crop of folks in the, uh, who are ready to take, thank you, ready to take over the leaders. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what happens. 
Um, I think the unfortunate attack of the speaker's husband, obviously, I think is a pall obviously on what is happening, but it's got to be sort of in the mind of the speaker in terms of she has specifically said he was attacked because of me. And so she's clearly thinking through sort of the impact on her family. But I think she's very much also buoyed by what happened on Tuesday. I mean, I can't under underestimate how much, even though we'll lose the House, it is really seen as um, kind of a win for the Democrats. So there's a lot of people who might have been prepared for sort of transition who are now sort of thinking about what this means, that it actually didn't go as bad. So we'll see what happens uh, with the speaker. So two of the nominees that are out there um, are um, ha Hakeem Jeffries from New York City, a member of Congress, um, very much interested in the role. Um, uh, no one's going to challenge the speaker. So I think what or my expectation at this point, I shouldn't I'll qualify it, that no one will do it. But should we find ourselves in a, le a real leadership race? I think Hakeem Jeffries from New York very much has the sort of lead leg up. He's been working on this for a long time. He's spent a lot of time um, traveling the country, helping other Democrats, and frankly, asking for other colleagues' support. Um, another person who is uh, heard to be interested is Adam Schiff. Um, who's a member of Congress you may know from California, who played a very active and visible role, particularly during the Trump administration. Um, I do think he's got, Hakeem has a little bit of a leg up because he has spent the last couple of years really working this. Um, so when Adam Schiff has gone to folks asking for their support, they've already, may have already committed. So that's an interesting piece. I do think one of the concerns about uh, Mr. Schiff, is, who's done an, a really incredible job in his role, is that it may hand the Republicans a little bit of a tool, like Speaker Pelosi is often villainized in the Republican with the Republican base. Adam Schiff may also give them an opportunity in a way that I don't think Hakeem Jeffries does. So it's an interesting to see what happens. If there's a full change in leadership, you'll see Catherine you'll likely see Catherine Clark of Massachusetts and Pete Aguilar of California sort of being in that rank. The one other sort of political note about uh, the races I'll mention is I think um, those of you who may be on the West Coast and or track the, um, the comings of the squad, as they're called, on the Democratic side, uh, Pramila Jayapal, I think may have been pretty interested. I think she got a little bit burned a couple of weeks ago. There was a letter that came out sort of potentially opening the door to engaging a conversation with Russia on Ukraine, which really sort of faced a lot of blowback. So I think that really hurt her. So we'll see. Um, we'll see what happens. I do think after uh, New York losing four or five seats, uh, there may be some push by folks on the progressive party that we've got to change sort of the regular order of business. Um, so interesting. Uh, Democratic leadership uh, election is November 30th. So stay hmm. tuned. Interesting. Next, I wanted to address um, incoming uh, leadership of the GOP uh, Ways and Means Committee. Obviously, this is an important committee to this group. Um, it sets tax policy here in Washington, D.C. I think um, one thing that we'll address as we get into the meat of uh, some of the policy um, uh, priorities of the incoming uh, House Republicans, a lot, of these, um, a lot of these policy proposals probably won't come to fruition, being that uh, President Biden obviously remains down the street at the White House. And I don't know if you would say the odds on our the, uh, Democrats to keep the Senate, but either way, you'd have a tight Senate to navigate these policy proposals through. Either way, uh, the three gentlemen that are in contention to uh, take over the Ways and Means Committee are the two Smiths, Adrian and Jason, Missouri and uh, Nebraska, respectively, and then Vern Buchanan, who has been on the panel for a number of years from Florida. Uh, I think that if you ask some in town, uh, they would say that Jason Smith has the edge. If you ask others, uh, they would tell you that leadership has been coalescing around Vern Buchanan. Uh, McCarthy was just actually down in Florida at Vern Buchanan's house for a fundraiser last week. So if that's any indication, um, maybe it is. Um, but again, I think these three gentlemen are very similar. There's not much difference as it comes to their uh, view on tax policy. And so I think that... Um, Either way, um, either, all three would be a, a good to lead that uh, uh, chairmanship in that committee. Uh, thank you. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to dive into a little bit more about where, where House Republicans would uh, go as far as their tax agenda. I think 
the biggest priority will be to preserve provisions of the tax, uh, uh, the Trump era tax cuts. Um, I think there there are several um, provisions outlined in the new le- legislation that are set to sunset uh, in, through 2025. We'll get into that more in a later slide. But here are some uh, priorities that they're going to be looking at. First would be the corporate tax rate. Of course, Republicans in general um, uh, view our corporate tax rate as too high. And um, I think that uh, Republicans will continue to combat tax rate increases proposed by the Biden administration. Democrats. You want the one before? The, the one Sorry. Before, please. My no, fault. No My problem. fault. Um, and then in 2021, President Biden obviously proposed raising the corporate tax rate from 21 to 28. As part, of the, as part of the bipartisan infrastructure law, Republicans struck the provision from the bill's language. Um, so look to, to Republicans in the House to continue fighting any increases in the corporate tax rate thought through the Biden administration. Um, and then on this as well, Republicans are expected to reject uh, Secretary Yellen's global 15 percent minimum corporate tax rate proposal. I think this could be one of the strongest um, points of contention for the Ways and Means Committee going forward. The second thing they'll look to do is uh, look at the top line individual income tax rate. Um, the individual tax rates are among the tax rates set to revert pre-2017 levels, if not made permanent. So this was a Trump era tax cut um, that needs to be made permanent before 2025. Um, Republicans will aim to maintain the top marginal rate at the current 37 uh, percent compared to the previous rate of 39.6. So again, current rate 37 previous rate was 39.6, and they need to uh, bake that in before 2025, or it'll go back to that previous rate. Uh, Republicans will also seek to increase the standard uh, deduction amount from the current $12,000 for single taxpayers and $24,000 for married taxpayers filing jointly. Again, something that was in the Trump era tax cuts that is set to sunset. Estate and gift taxes, I know this issue is important for uh, this group. Um, everyone knows the estate tax is your right to transfer property at your death. Um, something that was in the Trump era tax cuts that they'll look to uh, to make permanent. Um, Senator McConnell previously proposed a total repeal, repeal of the estate tax. Um, I think that the most more likely outcome here would be to include increasing the threshold for which the estate tax were to kick in. The fourth uh, uh, point here would be uh, Inflation Reduction Act. I think that you know, any tax cuts that were in, included in the Inflation Reduction Act, Republicans will go after um, the, those specifically were the electric vehicle tax credit, um, in, in ter- IRA, the, in, the internal revenue service budget, the IRS agents uh, that, that Republicans love to boogeyman, uh, whether they're going to come to your home or not, Republicans will be looking to take that out. Um, and then the mineral sourcing requirements. Fifth point here, uh, bonus depreciation for business property. Um, they, I think the Republicans of all of the Trump era tax cuts have uh, emphasized the need to preserve this um, among all else. And so look for Republicans to uh, prioritize that. And then the pass through entity tax deduction. Um, will be one that they look to make permanent as well. We've just gone over most of these uh, uh, Trump era tax cuts that are sunsetting. I think we wanted to just list all of them so that everyone was aware. Uh, There's a, a few that I didn't address, but the ones that I did just address, those are the priorities for Republicans in the House moving forward. Um, one thing that's interesting is, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about the politics of the SALT limitations. And that's one that I know that Hakeem Jeffries from uh, the state of New York and from the New York City area is uh, very supportive of a repeal on the SALT limitation. So it'll be interesting to see. This is where the politics and the policy overline um, what, you know, there might be more of a push from the leadership on that. So we'll see what happens. Um, And that sort of leads us into the next discussion of debt ceiling. And I don't know, many of you have probably had clients who sort of vaguely watch what's happening in Washington. They hear about the government running out of money and they want to know what it means 
uh, for their portfolios. And uh, so it's coming again. Uh, the debt ceiling uh, is set to uh, expire really about the fall of next year. We really shouldn't even be thinking about debt ce- raising the debt ceiling until honestly fall or winter of next year. Um, but Mr. McCarthy has been pretty vocal about uh, maybe not raising the debt ceiling and using it a bit as leverage uh, to try to take a whack at some of the spending from the Democrats. Um, I think a lot of Democrats are worried that there's going to be a game of chicken over debt ceiling and what then might be sort of on the table is, for example, some of the climate change provisions that were in the um, Inflation Reduction Act reconciliation bill. That's one that potentially would be on the table. Uh, also, uh, the the chairman of the Budget Committee in the Senate is Bernie Sanders of Vermont. He's been talking a lot about sort of settling this so that it doesn't become a political issue. And he has also said that um, the fear is not only would it be the climate change provisions, but there might also be an attempt to take a look at Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. I Listen, there's politics on both sides here. Obviously, uh, Chairman uh, Sanders is trying to say, let's get this resolved because otherwise your Social Security is on the mat. Um, we should really be talking about this next year. But if things change, there's going to be very much, I think, a push by sort of reasonable heads on the Hill Let's just get this resolved in the lame duck uh, of this year, you know, at the end of the year. So we don't find ourselves not only in a big chicken fight, but a chicken fight that may be coming against a place where we're sort of also contending with recession related issues. So we'll we'll see what happens with that. Um, Interestingly, uh, uh, Brendan Boyle, who's a congressman from the Philadelphia area and is in line to potentially become chairman of or a ranking member on the House Budget Committee uh, sent a letter indicating that maybe we should consider um, just sort of getting rid of the debt ceiling altogether and that there wouldn't be sort of a cap on that. And it sort of has politics and strange bedfellows. This week you heard both former President Trump really take a whack at that as sort of a silly idea. Um, But then you also heard President Biden, Biden sort of throw a bit of cold water on that idea because it shows I think the words were sort of responsibility uh, and so forth. So we'll we'll see what happens. Um, the hope is that this will can get resolved during debt season de- debt ce- during lame duck, excuse me. Uh, but we'll we'll see what happens. It's one of those things where it's in personal opinion. It's insane that we constantly have to sort of contend with this. It's sort of policy by nuclear option. Um, so the hope is that cooler minds will sort of come together and sort of deal with this. But I really hope we don't find ourselves next year uh, dealing with recession issues and then worrying about if the government's going to run out of money. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, No, I think that if I were incoming Speaker McCarthy, my my uh, my preference would be to get this taken care of in the lame duck and therefore not allow any of the fringe members of my caucus to force my hand and shut down the government for reasons that I don't control, right? So if we're going to have a, you know, knock out, dra- knock down, drag out fight about something, make it about something important, not something that's going to be done either way. That said, <laughs> that hasn't that, stopped him it. from using it in his uh, political talking points. The other piece we should think about, too, is uh, potentially money for Ukraine right. is sort of on the table, too. That's been a, you know, sort of a big priority of, of the Congress and the government. And there's very much, I think, a little... Um, we're starting to sense a pushback potentially if there's a shift that maybe we're going to reevaluate sort of this perception of unlimited funds going to right. the folks in Ukraine. Right. So a lot of big issues at stake. I, too, hope that we don't get to a big political football, but it's Washington. That's right. Uh, so, you know, we were talking a little bit, you know, we spent quite a bit of time talking about kind of the uh, if the Republicans take over. But we'll mention a couple of things should the Democrats sort of maintain control. Um, you know, one, I think there's very much a priority on the part of the Biden administration to continue to uh, nominate or have nominated judges get through the Senate confirmation process. That's a big priority. Obviously, um Leader McConnell, uh, President Trump did, you know, a pretty phenomenal job of getting their nominees through. And so I think the Biden administration, too, wants to make sure that they have the opportunity to put their fingerprint on what the judiciary looks like, including maybe a more diversified 
uh, pool of applicants that could be considered for judgeship. So that's it. There's also going to be, um, you know, there's also executive branch nominees that are still waiting to get through the process. And this is very much the time when there's kind of a switch in an administration. You're sort of two years in, which, you know, as someone who has done that before, it's like 14 years. So after two years, you're going to see very much a lot of folks in the administration, particularly those in senior level, really look to sort of move out, maybe sort of take advantage of the last two years of an administration, not knowing what will happen two years from now. And so there might be uh, even more nominations from the executive branch waiting. So very much important to have Senate majority so that we can try to help move through the nominations, both in judiciary and the executive branch. You know, Democrats talk about a Supreme Court vacancy. I have no idea. I sort of looked at the list. I'm, you know, I'll I'll defer to some of our Supreme Court experts here at McGuire Woods who can give me their thoughts. But um, I think a lot of Democrats are frankly a little bit gun shy after what happened to Merrick Garland. And there's very much a feeling that if there happened to be a Supreme Court vacancy open even next year, which would be three years out from an election, if the Republican Senate had the majority, even that might be too hard a field. So we'll see what happens. Um, listen, progressives always talk about ending the filibuster. Um, there very much was a lot of discussion around this on the Voting Rights Act earlier in the year. I don't really see it happening, but of course, if Democrats hold, I think there'll be a continued push by the progressives to get rid of the filibuster so you don't need a two thirds majority to limit debate. Um, very specifically, if the Republicans do take the House, I think the singular and most important role that the Democrats in a Senate majority would feel like their responsibility is to be a check on activity coming out of the House, like a real check and balance. So there's going to be, if the Republicans take over, there's going to be a lot of legislation that's passed through the House. Of course, there is the president, so he's the final sort of He's the final veto, but um, I think a lot of that won't even make it to the president's desk if you find yourself with Democrats in the majority in the Senate. So um, that's that. Um, um, but if we, regardless, as we said, it's going to be close. I think we want to think about, are there things that, you know, we're, I think we're trying to be positive here. I mean, we're giving sort of a political overview, but what are the opportunities for bipartisanship? What are sort of vehicles that they can work on? One of the ones that we talk about a lot is the child tax credit. Um, as you know, sort of a fully refundable tax credit. And it expanded the tax credit to 3,600 if your children are under six for each child, six to 16, moved it up to 3,000. And there's, as you know, a $3,000 credit for 17 year olds. This has gotten a lot of widespread bipartisan support. So it is, regardless of what happens, I think uh, a piece of legislation that could think about. Um, some of you may also be interested in the tax break uh, for gifts to nonprofits. Um, there's very much an effort to um, and the tax break loophole for gifts to nonpartisan organizations. And we mentioned in our slides, uh, Senator Grassley, who also got reelected on Tuesday, and Angus King, independent but caucuses with the Democrats, have introduced legislation, um, which does place limits on tax breaks for donor advised funds. And very naturally, we have to talk about defense spending. That is a natural place to talk about where Republicans and Democrats have a long history of coming together. We continue to think there'll be expanded growth in the 23 and 24 budgets. That's a real opportunity where Republicans and Democrats can come together to talk about the future of the defense industry, defense legislation. Um, and we'll spend a few minutes on, um, and I see we're getting close to one, Bill, so we'll uh, sort of move along. Um, we'll spend a few minutes talking about interest rates uh, and and the bond market. I know a lot of you are sort of paying, potential, paying attention particularly to the bond market. Um, there's been a lot of attention to Chairman Powell, the Federal Reserve, um, and his efforts on stemming back inflation. Last week was the 75 basis point increase, which comes on the heels of six to seven months of continuous increases. As we say, there's sort of a uh, cumulative increase of 300 basis points, um, largest cumulative hike in 15 years. Um, Senate Democrats in particular, but not limited to the Senate. There's also House Democrats are very upset about what's happening with Chairman Powell. There's been pretty... Uh, significant letters from Senator Warren and a group of 
House and Senate Democrats, as well as Senator Hickenlooper, who is a moderate from Colorado business owner, both raising issues with the concern about this sort of appearing to be unending increase of interest rates and their concern with Americans um, on affordability on housing and car loans and the ability to start and grow a business. And so there's been a lot of press attention about it. I expect I know that Senator Warren sent a list of questions that she'd like to see answered. I expect that this will be an ongoing topic no matter what happens, but very much um, a sense that obviously interest rates increase, but this kind of increase with the sense of we don't know when it ends is very disconcerting to a lot of people, obviously, but particularly um, folks on the Hill. So we'll see a lot of that bond market. Um, you know, you all know, <laughs> frankly, better than us about the concerns about it and the um, overall hesitancy of investors in the market. Um, I've been told, don't look at my 401k, so I won't. <laughs> um, but regardless of high costs, interest rates, um, the bond market, the economic message was definitely one that I think the Republicans um, really messaged going into Tuesday. Um, do you want to end yeah. crime, of course, but if you want to take a minute to talk about that. Sure. And I think that the thing to note here for incoming House Republicans especially would be um, that obviously they focused on inflation as a political issue. Uh, if you look at their um, so-called commitment to America, this is the um, pre-election policy manifesto that they put out, similar to Newt Gingrich's old uh, contract with America back in 1994. The number one thing in that um, in that policy agenda was an economy that's strong, meaning uh, that they are on day one going to tackle inflation and the cost of living. And so hopefully, um, while uh, Senator Sander, uh, Senators Warren and Hickenlooper, I, I think this could be an area for, for bipartisanship, but as they push on the uh, Chairman Powell to stop raising uh, interest rates, perhaps Republicans in the House can start to address inflation and cost reduction. So uh, it could be kind of an interesting uh, hitting it from both sides uh, in a bipartisan fashion. Terrific. Um, final piece, I think, for us is to talk a little bit about the Biden administration and sort of what the future is. Going into, as we mentioned, going into Tuesday, there was a lot of discussion about a weakened president, terrible poll numbers, and a lot of discussion in D.C. Um, about if he doesn't run, who's going to run? Um, it's unlikely anyone would challenge him, but there's very much a question of, uh, well, he's weak. He won't run for re-election. He's gotten a lot of big legislative accomplishments. He's achieved what he's always dreamed of, of being the president. Maybe it would be time for um, 24 for him to step aside. Um, there's very much not a sense um, for me, and I don't know what you've heard on your side of the aisle, but that... Um, this isn't a situation where I think Democrats would just sort of step aside for the vice president um, as a sort of protocol thing. There's very much discussion, not only amongst um, officials in Washington, but even governors and so forth around the country, I think, who are thinking about making a run for the presidency. So we will um, certainly see what happens. But I think after Tuesday, the White House political team, I think, is uh, probably emboldened a little bit um, that it was actually a pretty decent day, all things being considered as we thought going in. Some of the things that we'll be watching, particularly in the space of issues that are important to you all, is look about look at to what's going to happen at Treasury. Very much a sense that Secretary Yellen, sometime after the midterms, will uh, will depart as um, Treasury Secretary. Um, I think we may see a fight between sort of the more progressive wing of the Democratic Party. Um, but I think moderate Democrats plus Republicans maybe might come together to sort of push for a more moderate candidate. Um, and some of the names that we've heard are Gina Raimondo, former governor of Rhode Island, who is the Commerce Secretary, or Lael Brennard, the vice chair of the Federal Reserve. Um, you know, it'll be interesting. Uh, uh, Secretary Raimondo almost called her governor um, because, you know, she's perceived as a moderate uh, and had a lot of challenges when she ran for governor because she took on pension reform and a lot of tough issues. So we'll be watching Treasury. Also, Brian Deese, who's the National Economic Council director. We've heard murmurings of him potentially leaving. 
Um, you know, look, it's a, I can't imagine a more thankless job right now than to be the person who has to talk to the president about inflation numbers every day. Um, but he's worked really hard, done a, done a, you know, a sort of a really great job. We're really challenging situation. It's um, it's funny, sort of a little bit like Groundhog Day. Gene is incredible, but we've heard Gene Sperling's name again, um, who has served in this capacity both for President Clinton and for President Obama. So interesting to see what happens there. Um, we had heard that uh, a couple of months ago, Ron Klain, chief of staff, had asked, sent a note around asking folks at the White House, if you don't think you're going to stay through the four years, could you let us know so that they could do kind of planning? As we said earlier, this is a natural break for folks to leave. Um, and they are, as we mentioned, sort of creating sort of a talent search group to prepare for the potential vacancies, potentially senior vacancies across the uh, administration. So not only are they going to be fighting on the legislative front, they're also going to be probably making sure that they've got the workforce they need to tackle the last two years. Whatever happens with President Biden and his plans for 2024, the next two years is about cementing legacy, even if it is just one term. And they're going to need partners throughout the administration to do that. And that'll be a top priority for them. So um, it's a lot. It's been a really interesting week. It'll continue to be, as we said. Um, but, you know, I feel fortunate to have such a good partner like Scott and others. Um, we, where we can think about how we can best help our clients sort of navigate the changes. We think no matter what happens, we're always prepared. So, um, Bill, we'll toss it over to you. <clears throat> Mona and Scott, I want to thank you for this. Um, I know it's sort of an impossible task to think about and predict what's going to happen in the future, but it's incredibly helpful to us. And especially thank you for your focus on the, the, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act um, stuff. We know that's a priority and something uh, people, our clients, our advisors, the people that are attending this are thinking a lot about. So appreciate the focus on that. Um, get some rest, guys. You deserve it. <laughs> um, uh, I, I hope it comes soon. Um, and, and to the rest of our audience, we thank you for being here, um, for being a part of this. All of the folks that um, presented today, going back to Farhan and Abby and Steve, we're available if you have any follow-up questions. We'll be sending a, a follow-up email, I'm sure, with, uh, and if you have any comments about how this went, other topics you'd like to hear, um, things that we can do to improve this, um, we welcome them because we're trying to make this um, as good an event as it's been for the last um, 15 and hope we'll do it for another 15. <laughs>